Hello and welcome to South Asia. My name is Amne Sheikh Faruqi and I'm so excited to bring you our segment for the WOW Global 24 Festival from hot and humid Karachi in Pakistan. I've been involved with the WOW Festivals as a curator since 2016. And in this time, we have delivered three festivals in Karachi. Here's my souvenir mug. And we are working on expanding our outreach to other cities. So WOW in South Asia, that is Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka in 2019 alone reached 55,000 women, girls, men, and boys in face-to-face -face discussions around gender equality. And we engaged a further 15 million people online across the globe. My own background is in social development. I have worked for over a decade as part of a varied bunch of economic empowerment, gender and environmental initiatives. I'm an author, a textile activist, and I run a social enterprise that employs a fair trade and arts and cultural lens to traditional approaches to inclusive livelihoods. I am so thrilled to be partnering with the VOW Foundation to bring you critical discussions from across the South Asian region at a time when the global COVID-19 pandemic has forced governments and development partners to recognize that responses that mitigate harm must include gender considerations at their fore to ensure positive long-term effects on the stabilization of women and girls across the world. Other than these very important talks and discussions, the lineup we bring you today also has some fantastic performances from amazing artists and musicians. So I promise you, you have some incredibly rich, diverse, and powerful content to look forward to. Whether it's a talk by our very own local champion for inclusive and safe digital spaces for women, Nigadad, or we listen to Shaylee Bassnet, a mountaineer and a comic who works against sexual abuse and violence the women whose work we are so excited to feature today play a critical role in the inclusive, equitable futures we want for tomorrow. Performances, of course, I, should, I would be remiss not to mention those. They're at the heart of every WOW Festival and WOW Global 24 is no different. So we have amazing arts practitioners lined up, but I would particularly like to mention Razana Yasmin, reading from a stunning collection of works from young poets across Bangladesh who write evocatively and imaginatively about timeless themes of love, death, discrimination, disillusionment, while also focusing on beauty and hope. And of course, because this is South Asia, we have dance and music. And that's such an important part of our culture. And I'm so excited that it's a part of some of the beautiful offerings that you can look forward to today. I'm personally very excited to hear from incredible artists talking about the need for there to be more female icons in the media and in the arts. In a panel called Project Women Way, we feature women artists from Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, talking about the representation of women in the arts and the idea of body image. This conversation is complemented by video clips of the artists at work allowing us to show you a close-up view of how they address these issues through their art. So without any further ado, I give you what the WOW community has to offer you today from South Asia. Please do get involved with the WOW Global 24 Festival Conversations on social media, and do not forget to use the hashtag WOWGlobal24. We'd love to hear from you. And now let's dive straight into a panel discussion on the environment and feminist responses to the same. A quick shout out to dear friend and fellow curator, Dr. Fawzia Tahir, who's one of the many incredible women we feature in this conversation. Welcome to this panel on the environment and feminist responses. I'm Sabina Shrestha, your moderator for this panel. I'm a journalist and a filmmaker from Nepal. We've been living in unusual times, the norms before March has been replaced by a new norm. And remember like towards the end of 2019 when school children, children around the world were like protesting to pressure global leaders to ensure a safe future for them by reversing global warming. Like my kids who are now eight and 10 were on the street with placards as well. And at one point my son told me then that they are not as lucky as me for they are convinced that they're gonna die at the age of 30 and I got to live longer. And at that time, climate change felt super urgent. 
Right now, emissions have gone down, but only by a little bit with measures to control COVID-19. But is this just a blip? Or have we learned enough? Or are we going to rush back to our old ways? We've been warned of an impending humanitarian crisis from water wars and mass migration. We've seen natural disasters from cyclones, floods to droughts, and even now a pandemic. To discuss these issues, the role of women in environmental activism, we have a team of women who are leading the battle for environmental sustainability. We'll hear about the experiences and the challenges that our environment is facing and how we can promote biodiversity in the natural habitat and sustainable economic development practices. And how should we be thinking about the impact of COVID-19 on these issues? We have with us Dr. Fazia from the Khyber village in Hunza in the north of Pakistan, where she grew up very close to nature, where she says local practices were seen as wholesome. Food was produced and consumed locally. The electricity at home was zero carbon because it was hydro. And the communities generally generated very little waste. So after high school, she chose environmental sciences, specifically on human interaction with the environment. While at university in Pakistan, she got involved in environmental activism and managed to push, push her at university to be plastic free. She's got a DPhil from Oxford where she looked at membrane technology for water treatment. I'm sure she'll explain all of that much later. Um, she now teaches at the Center for Water Informatics and Technology, WIT, that's in Lahore University of Management Science. And her research focuses on waste management and the interaction um, of solid waste with wastewater. We have Charmaine uh, Nil Nilormi, sorry if I pronounce it uh, wrong from Bangladesh, who's an economist and an expert on gender justice and climate change. Now, her story will resonate with so many of us. Like Charmin didn't start by being a powerhouse that she is now. So after university, she did what? So many of us do all the time, got married, had a child, and her daughter had autism. And as a primary caregiver, Charmin's work-life balance was thrown aside. And, and many of us who are mothers can totally understand that. And you can very well imagine the added um, challenges. And, and as many, must, many of us can um, relate to, especially now that isolation and struggle sent her into a depression, and writing an academic inquiry really helped her, helped her get out of it. So when she started, like whenever she could, she started traveling and interacting with people from rural communities, often carrying her daughter with her. So moved by the uh, stories of people, she started writing more. She and her husband, a climate scientist, formed a team and her journey to climate activism started. So Sharmin now has been, um, she's teaching economics at Jahangir Nagar University, Savar, in Bangladesh since 1995 with a focus on environmental economics, climate change, vulnerability, disaster risk re reduction, and gender. She's contributed to intergovernmental panels on climate change, changes fifth assessment report, and has advised the Bangladeshi Ministry of Environment and Forest and Department of Women's Affairs in formulating policies on gender issues related to climate change impact in Bangladesh. And she's led a nationwide campaign on sustainable rural life, in, um, and she's like built these cri climate tri tribunals, uh, mock tri climate tribunals, which I'm sure she's gonna talk more about. And she's also been advising the Bangladeshi Parliament on the LDC's positions on what to negotiate in the UN climate negotiation processes. Um, earlier, I also talked um, to Lakshmi Gurung. She's from Nepal. Um, Lakshmi is a tourism entrepreneur who still lives in our native village of Kagbeni, which is in the Annapurna region. Now, Kagbeni is in Mustang, a district that is traditionally on the salt trade route. Um, so men used to travel all the time and women managed absolutely everything else. And with global warming, um, Kagbeni uh, and her, her village along with the region are in the front lines of climate change. So Lakshmi did a master's in tourism and hotel management from Lincoln University. Her master's thesis paper was on sustainable tourism and agriculture in Kagbeni, her village. Uh, she's been active in a community where she's been promoting agriculture-based um, sustainable tourism. 
I'm so pleased to uh, share this panel with the three of you. In the next section, each panelist will introduce their work to counter the effects of climate change, promote bi biodiversity in, uh, in the natural habitat, sustainable economic practices, water, and um, and also they're also going to touch a little bit upon like how does environmental change impact men and women dif differently in um, their particular uh, uh, specific fields. Um, if we could do that in the order, like I introduce you um, from Dr. Fozia to Charmin and then uh, uh, Lakshmi, that'd be great. Should we start with Dr. Um, Dr. Fozia, please? Thank you, Sabina, for such a kind introduction. Uh, very honored to be a part of this, uh, this panel. Um, my name is Fazia Edino, and I'm an environmental activist and environmental researcher, and I belong to Hunza. As Sabina mentioned, I grew up in a society that was very close to nature. Um, as I was growing up, we built the micro hydro power project. Uh, my village was also a pioneer in, in ibex conservation, and uh, we started um, trophy hunting in, in this part of the world, which is very new. Prior to that, we were just excessively hunting my, uh, the, the ibex population. It had come down. Um, that and the agriculture and the food and all of those things that you mentioned. So it, it built that connection uh, that I have with nature and then eventually led for me to become an environmental science, sciences ma major in my undergrad, my MS, and eventually in my DPhil, I did um, the membrane technology for wastewater treatment and converted it into a clean drinking water. Um, the two technologies that I use, which are called membrane distillation and forward osmosis, are set to be less energy intensive. So I think they have a huge role to play in future when we run out or when we become a water scarce country. As we know that Pakistan, despite having plenty of surface water, has now um, become a water scarce country and we, we are running into several problems uh, with reference to water. Um, so that and uh, during this journey, I of course explored all the, the areas that I could and um, by being from a rural setting and then studying in an urban setting gave me that broader perspective uh, about environment. And of course, as you mentioned, the women in the rural climates um, have a different role. So when I was growing up, my cousins used to bring water because we didn't have a water supply, but, but as I was growing up, that, that changed. So we had a proper water supply system, you know, and a lot of things improved. But when I went to the cities and I saw the lifestyle there of having a lavish lifestyle, luxury cars, uh, you know, more resources, more waste, more wastewater, lesser treatment, because here we have septic tanks where we treat wastewater, where, whereas um, there there was uh, open canals where the wastewater was dumped into. So all of that was just so eye opening for me that um, that in the process I learned and I also decided to teach others because I realized that many people do not take all of this in, these into into account. Uh, since I've come back from Oxford, because my um, study there, unfortunately, could not be implemented here straight away. So I decided to start with something simple and basic. So when I came back to my hometown with the Environmental Protection Agency here, we um, the, the thing that you talked about where I made my campus plastic free, I had a dream of making my a village plastic free as well, because my village has a legacy of making environmental cons conservation projects successful. So when I came here and I spoke to them, I realized that the Environmental Conservation and, and Environmental Protection Agency is already thinking about doing it. So with them, I was able to um, make my village one of the first villages in Upper Hunza to adopt a ban on polyeth polyethylene bag use. Um, and after that, when I joined LAMS, I had, um, of course, to choose where do I want to put my research skills into. And I chose microplastic pollution because I wanted it to relate to my activism. So my activism was mostly towards um, not trashing, reducing plastic use, reducing consumerism, and then eventually, of course, reducing the solid waste uh, pollution. And I think that in Pakistan and countries like Pakistan, there is a strong relation between solid waste management and wastewater management. Uh, and microplastic pollution sort of gave me that space where I could use something that, that I'm campaigning about with something that I actively research on. Uh, so I used microplastic pollution research uh, for, for my initial study. And then um, while I was doing that, I realized that in the urban setting that I was, it was too urban and too academic elite for me. And then I decided that I needed to, to go to, into the ground to see what's happening around the city, a city which is very happy and lively, like Lahore. You tend to forget people around you who could be living a marginalized life. 
Um, and because I was working on plastic pollution and plastic pollution reduction, I then chose to work with uh, this community of Waste Avengers with an initiative, which is a women initiative in LUMS, actually, who funded this, where I work now with female waste scavengers in Lahore who cater to the areas where the local um, authority is not catering to. So that has been another um, aspect of the study, which, which is, of course, very overwhelming. I learn something new every day. And I learn um, that how we've mismanaged not only environment, but the human interactions and the human lifestyle as well. And, and that rich, poor divide and that um, elite marginalized divide is so obvious and, and you understand the, the, the term env environmental intersectionality very well on how we are not only just um, exploiting our environment but also the at times the human and the human interactions within it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharmin, if you can um, expand a little bit more. I mean, I, th I think what you just said, like about the vulnerabilities, I mean, even in the times of COVID, we have seen that the most vulnerable are the ones who are the most impacted. And, the, and I assume that's the same for um, the most vulnerable in all communities. Um, Dr. Sharmin, uh, Sharmin, please, um, if you could. Thank you, Sabina, and thank you for a nice uh, introduction. And it's great uh, meeting all the energized uh, and inspiring woman from South Asia. Uh, as you said, I actually uh, born and brought up in a university campus where my parents worked. And that was uh, with Lash Green, open spaces and all that. Uh, and and uh, I, um, I was a good score student. And after my master's, I entered in teaching and dreamt of you know going abroad uh, having a good uh, degree and come back i was involved in student uh, politics as well so i always had a dream of serving uh, common people uh, um, having that in mind uh, i started my journey in professional career and uh, um, just after my uh, joining in the university, I got married. Then I we had a child. And in that journey, my husband uh, is a climate change scientist, and he helped me a lot. Uh, uh, in early 2000, in climate change discourse, there is hardly any human face. Actually, that was all driven by science, the whole IPCC process, the whole climate negotiation and the whole publication area for climate change. That was uh, actually driven by uh, crude science. There was no human face. So when uh, we teamed up, we uh, actually, he briefed me on the science, why something is going wrong, what will be the projections, what is the sign behind, for example, the salinity, the storm surges, the heat waves and all that. And I could see the human faces and we started traveling across the country. And uh, actually I packed my daughter and three of us moved uh, uh, in a major way all over the country and then Bangladesh being a small delta, we have been you know, experiencing a different hydrogeophysical realities in different parts of the country. And that made be understood that, uh, you know, salinity is impacting in a, in a major way, other area drought is impacting in another way and all that. Now the question remains what you, Sabine, you asked, uh, how weather can be gendered? In early 2000, believe me, there was no such documentation that whether uh, the vulnerability was differential among men and women. How climate change can bring differential impacts to men and women. So we started exploring and documenting how uh, the vulnerabilities can be different in terms of disaster uh, response in terms of uh, uh, climate change response. Uh, just to uh, note you that uh, in 1991, we had a great cyclone wh where we lost 0.3 million people. 
and 90% of uh, the deceased were female. And that could explain uh, how vulnerable women can be in, term, uh, you know, in, in the time of extreme weather events, in times of disaster, even in slow onset uh, disaster like salinity. So, uh, you know, we documented the first ever global uh, synthesis on climate vulnerability and uh, brought uh, gender dimension in, in, in it. And the Bangladesh government actually uh, um, patronized the whole work and we published on behalf of Bangladesh government. And uh, that was uh, uh, noticed by the UNFCCC process. And I was linked after that with the global uh, women activist groups like Gender CC, Gender and Climate Change Network, Women for Climate Justice in 2007. And we started our journey in climate negotiation in the UNFCCC process. Uh, and you can remember that, Sabine, I can tell you that uh, uh, before 2007 Conference of the Parties is COP13, before that, uh, the human dimension in climate change was missing. And uh, it's people like us uh, uh, who went to Bali that year, the Conference of the Parties were, was held in Bali, and we tried, we, we demonstrated uh, documented, and we tried to attract the policymakers, different country party members, that you need to uh, flag the vulnerabilities faced by men and women, the indigenous communities, the disabilities, and uh, we started our journey uh, from there. And I can tell you that uh, uh, the women and gender constituency, uh, the space created in the climate change negotiation uh, we were actually uh, the influencer to uh, uh, constitute that constituency. This constituency actually provides the women activists the space in climate negotiation to uh, flag the issues concerning gender, women, and other minority groups. And uh, UNFCCC Secretariat actually asks uh, uh, recommendation from this constituency that what should be done, uh, uh, you know, for more uh, women and for more other vulnerable uh, communities. So uh, that's how it started. Then I got involved in uh, a nationwide uh, campaign that was on agriculture and climate change. Um, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, campaign actually formulated different campaign materials, uh, climate tribunal, the first ever climate time tribunal that we hosted. Uh, and then uh, my research was uh, with uh, you know vulnerable communities. I, I worked with uh, climate change adaptation uh, and community-based adaptation is my interest. I work with communities, uh, how the resistance is growing, how the resilience is growing. So yeah, that, that's how I, I link my research with uh, communities, with the global communities, with the local communities. And I try to influence the local parliamentary members and the uh, top policy makers with my research outputs. And I brief them with uh, LDC negotiation points uh, on a regular basis before going to uh, COP process. Uh, last, uh, for that matter, in this round, that being an acad academician from a third world, I don't believe that uh, I set aside my all my activities and I keep on just writing and publishing papers in peer-reviewed journals. My research needs to be connected with activism, and that's why I connect my act academic life and research learning to activism. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, right now, it just feels like everyone has to be a climate activist. Um, I'm, I'm, earlier, we checked with uh, Lakshmi's internet and we uh, found out that we had some issues. She is um, in um, Dagbeni and um, I believe that the internet's not that great right now, but we did earlier record a video 
um, where I um, where she's explained what she's been doing. So we can uh, try that now. And if internet does uh, get better, we can go back into asking a few questions. Thank you, uh, Subina. This is Lakshmi Gurung from Kagbini Mustang. Uh, I, uh, after graduating from Lincoln University, New Zealand, I decided to come back to uh, 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 my roots in 2014 uh, to serve my community to help and to look after my family-run business. Uh, I'm, today I'm working at Yagdonalds as a promoter, my family-owned biz uh, tourism business. And the main aim of the Yagdonald is to promote and provide locally grown products to the needs of tourists. I am also working with the community, uh, encouraging them to grow more locally and reduce or uh, discourage uh, importing uh, manufactured foods and goods from outside. Academically, I'm also contributing in researching uh, and writing articles on the, uh, on the field, in the field of tourism, agriculture, environment related issues, climate change, uh, etc. Uh, along with that, I'm also helping the community, uh, women to empower themselves in the field of, in the process, in the field of um, decision making and uh, leadership qualities. Uh, because I have noticed in being in woman, uh, being woman in uh, Mustang, must, uh, the roles of women has been played a uh, very important role since the time of uh, salt trade to the to the present uh, COVID-19 pandemic. They have been great uh, caretaker, homemaker, farmers, entrepreneurs, problem solver, um, uh, maid, chef, but their contribution has never been uh, evaluated in this uh, customary rule of patriarchy system in uh, Mustang. So I'm just trying to be a voice for them and encourage them to be also a part of it. And I'm also very happy to tell you that uh, at present I'm working with uh, around 3,000 uh, local people, farmers, women, uh, tourism entrepreneurs in the region. And along with that, I'm also noticing a pat changing pattern of climate in Mustang. When we were kids, we hardly have a rain, uh, rain in Mustang. But at present, there was continuous rain for a month and this has become a worrisome and this has destroyed uh, our uh, heritage homes made from mud because Mustang is also known as a city of mud and uh, also we need to now think about restructuring our buildings if it happens so our heritage style of home will be disappear disappear and then another uh, thing is also a threat for our traditional crops. That is buckwheat and bar barley in when we are in the past, but now anything puts under the ground grows. So uh, in these agricultures, like uh, traditional agriculture has lots of uh, uh, rituals, customs, uh, we're connected and, but uh, if new crops and everything will be changed. So this is also disappearing of our culture values. And also in the place called the in, uh, De in Upper Mustang, where a uh, whole settlement has been relocated because of um, climate change, the scarcity of water. And this also has become losing of sense of the place. So this uh, has, and uh, if we don't have, if climate change happen and if we are uh, moving or we are our heritage homes are losing then uh, what uh, how we will hand over our ancestor um, properties or belongings to the next generation is a big question mark so this worries me a lot and this is has become a big issues and this is not a uh, issues of uh, myself my community, my country, but it's a global issues. So I think we need to address it sooner as possible and work together to save our planet. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'd also asked uh, um, Lakshmi earlier about the impacts of COVID in her region and what it has been meant for women and um, climate around there. 
Well, Sabina, uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 is a nightmare to us and our mankind. Uh, most of our daily activities has been affected and no business, no movement of people locked down for nearly three months and our life has been affected, um, affected our no social life and this has affected economically, psychologically and physically. But the positive side of the COVID-19 is that it has stopped mankind from doing uh, activities that are harming environment more. This has helped our natural habitat and environment to regenerate and regrowth, and which we failed to do so since long time. Uh, in my opinion, for new normal, it's that we need to follow now. It's time to follow us three pillars of sustainable development, also known as three E's. That is envir uh, environment, equity, and economics. If we implement these three uh, E's in a balanced way and do any kind of business or in the field of development or work, I think it will, sustainable, it will be sustained for long term. With this, I would like to thank. Thank you so much. So going back into talking to all of you, I'm, I'm going to ask a question to Dr. Fawzia. I mean, um, are scientists and women scientists the same? I mean, the fact that you're called a woman scientist already, I mean, does it make a difference uh, in your work? I mean, and do you get explained to? That, that's a great question. A part of me wants to say that there's no difference between a, a male researcher and a female researcher and that a scientist is a scientist. Uh, we generally never uh, take our gender as an excuse to not go into the field and work in the field. But that said, um, as I was doing my undergrad and master's, I have seen certain supervisors suggest a certain topic to the female researchers. They say, you don't want to go into the field. Why don't you just do this questionnaire online or do this and that and let's get you done with it. And sometimes it's a request from the female researcher side as well. Um, so that's, that's one part of it. And of course, it comes more from our culture and our, our backgrounds. But I would like to mention one thing that now that I am in one of the top universities in Pakistan, when I started my work on microplastic research, um, I wanted to do it because it felt the right thing to do. No one has quantified microplastic in Pakistan and it's it sort of related to my overall scheme of research. Uh, when I told people that I want to do it, most of the male colleagues would ask me, but why do you want to do it? You know, why does it matter? Because for them, the problems are bigger and broader and the solutions are bigger and broader as well. Um, whereas the intricacies to which a female scientist can go, I don't think male scientists have the tendency to go towards it. So they said, if microplastic can pass on through your feces, why do you worry about it? And then I had to explain that because plastics can absorb toxic chemicals, maybe it can harm you, maybe it can harm the, the biology or the ecosystem in the water streams. But, but moments like those, and generally, um, for example, when I present and come back, because in my everyday life, I'm a very common uh, person. So my, my discussion never becomes too scientific for, for people. So if, sometimes when I present and come back, people do ask me that, oh, we do not expect you to give such a technical presentation. And, and that's when, you know, I, I, just, I just sit and say, oh, should, what should I do about this? Should I be more technical other than my technical talks? Or should I be less technical in my talks? Like, how do you go about it? So, so part of it would say absolutely nothing that a scientist is a scientist who, whose work is to research. But I think Part of me wants to insert here slightly that there are all those biases that come with, with our culture, with the areas that we are from, which, which you cannot just take away like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose like people just imagine a scientist being a man and they are completely thrown aback. And what you said, like, you know, whether you should be more personable or more technical, I don't think there's ever a right answer. I mean, whatever you do, you're going to get fingers pointed at at some point or the other, I assume. Um, Charmaine, uh, you've been like talking to governments, trying to explain to the government what they should be doing. How do you find the responses? How difficult is it? And what are some of the pushback that you get? Uh, thank you for asking that critical question. I, I, I say it critical. I don't say that government is not responsive. Neither I say that they're responsive. What does that mean? Uh, 
in uh, on paper there are documents uh, there are strategies that uh, everything on paper is uh, you know seems quite uh, organized but in real life uh, uh, when i talk about gender when i talk about ldc position the emission targets uh, and blah 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 that's uh, you know that's all right but when i talk about the special vulnerability of men and women then people uh, you know, says oh okay yeah yeah it says of course you you talk about gender so it's uh, uh, like it's automatically comes that way but it doesn't right we see many women you know they don't actually carry the messages is uh, even uh, many men professionals men colleagues of ours they do very sensible uh, interventions they do very sensible uh, uh, research on women issues so it's not only women uh, you know it's just an advantage that we we have been experiencing through that's an added advantage but that it doesn't guarantee that you you become a women activist and uh, uh, the thing is uh, I, what i found that government thinks that it's a uh, gender women oh it's it's quite natural and 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 we know all about it for example you know uh, I, i can give you one interesting example i have so many examples to share uh, you know i i travel a lot and 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 I, I love to be connected with the rural people. Uh, once uh, I uh, visited uh, Isla affected area, I, uh, Isla was uh, hit in the South Coastal Belt in Bangladesh in 2009, and I was in an evaluation team. So uh, we, we actually uh, visited that place. Before visiting that place, that's an embankment which was completely uh, disrupted uh, washed away and people without having any shelter within the embankment they need to needed to relocate uh, uh, you know very quickly and and uh, uh, the part of the embankment was salvaged and this you know started uh, living on them that's a very tiny little with uh, of embankment all we know about them that's right so before going there visiting there i started talking to local administration and in that place in that meeting the civil society representatives the ngo representatives and all other uh, ministry people departmental government officials were there and the top local administrator was you know kind of saying that uh, Uh, look we have done enough we we, we give we have given them that much of money they have received that uh, and they're good i i visited them on a weekly holiday on friday last friday and i saw people you know had their cow slaughtered and they are having their girls wedding with festivity so things are you know things are okay all of one ngo activities a activist a lady stood up raised her hand and said this is the upojila we call it upojila the you know local level governance this is the first ever upojila in bangladesh who declared 100% sanitary coverage and after that storm the whole wash system is gone away because it is the embankment they are living on and on embankment we which is you know already uh, bruised and and every time the you know water is coming and recedes no toilet can be reestablished over there and women at young age because there is no toilet facilities they are having contraceptive to check their monthly period monthly ministerial cycle and taking that risk on their reproductive health and the local administrator i acknowledge that he gave the money he promised and people said they received but he didn't notice that there is a huge uh, gap in sanitation which is very important for women not for women's being as well being a reproductive health it needs to be that administrative's uh, you know administration's duty to address and uh, the festivity he was referring to you know the government is promoting 
uh, a girl's uh, child education with uh, providing them free stipend. And in such disastrous events, we can see that, you know, people become poorer and the poorer family are forced to get their uh, daughters, uh, you know, married in, uh, in their early years. And that has huge social impact. So we actually miss that, the administrator having all the honesty, so to say, you know, in disbursing money, that's not corruption. But he missed all the nitty gritty detail that is important. Money is what for? Money is for life. Money is for my family. Money is for my well-being. And if that well-being is missing, I can't provide that service. Money doesn't help me, you know, in a much uh, better way. If I don't have the access to shelter, if I don't have the access to protection, if I don't have the access uh, to education, if I don't have the access to sanitation, you know, there is no meaning having, uh, you know, some thousands of uh, taka in hand, you know? So that's, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, to cut short, the last example, I, I, I hope that would be more interesting because it's a global, uh, global thing. You know, all uh, we are very good in cyclone warning. We are very good like in cyclone warning system. Uh, in 1991, we lost 0.3 million people for the same intensity of cyclone. Actually, we don't lose people right now. And we made cyclone shelters in the coastal belt. And we made, you know, it's just a two-story building. One for the, the first story, there is nothing. We allow water to recede. That comes with the cyclone, the surge. And the second floor, the, the, the first floor, people go and, and take refuse. And the only toilet that is established in the ground floor where nothing is, you know, there. People are in the, in the first floor and the toilet is in the ground floor. And I ask a woman, why didn't you go during the cyclone? You received the cyclone uh, warning, right? To so say, say, I don't know whether I need to take refuse for three hours or three days without having the uh, toilet, which is actually submerged in a cyclone uh, time. I don't know, uh, you know, whether I can use that toilet. So for me, it's an important thing. It's a just uh, engineering structure that the engineers actually. I'm, I'm afraid the internet connection has gone down a little bit over there. But, um, I have actually covered a few uh, floods and cyclones. And I happened to be in uh, 2008 when um, Cyclone Nargis hit um, Myanmar. And at that time, I remember a lot of women who had died, a lot of women who were complaining about the same access to um, sanitation, access to toilets, access to um, uh, sanitary pads. And then um, I later checked that like, out, of, out of all the people who had died, where more than 100,000 people had died at that time, 61% happened to be women. And that that is the sad reality that disaster strikes men and women in different ways. And but again, like um, I think now that Lakshmi is over here, what what I what would be interesting is like you know in a place like Nepal, especially in Mustang, where women are supposed to be much more um, uh, economically free. Um, I assume that working with men especially when it comes to having direct policy issues um, and tackling policies on sustainable tourism to uh, sustainable um, agriculture. It must be quite challenging, should it be a small word? Uh, how, how do you see it? Well, um, I find it's still challenging, even though like most of the women does the um, house activities as well as the uh, tourism activities in the regions. And they contribute lots of uh, lots of times in the uh, uh, economic as well as social or other activities. But still, in the in the process of making decisions, they are always uh, uh, low. Uh, there is always below. 
and which is I feel very sad is I'm like I went to a university in the Western world and when I came back and I have like one examples that uh, uh, to conceptualize uh, 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 theme park like uh, like we I I, I was uh, working I have like uh, to promote a tourism product new this is kind of new tourism product but then that was like I have lots of challenges this is last year which I did and this is a, a very big challenges because they told me that I'm disqualified for this one because ineligible because um, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not in the process of like in the decision making in the village, you know, and that's why I feel very angry. And I said, okay, um, I'm a woman, but I am a, a citizen of Nepal, and the fund has come from Nepal government, and I'm going to make it. So I uh, somehow I fought, 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 and then uh, there was lots of obstacles by men. And you know the village, and they like brainwash. Oh, woman cannot do, woman cannot come up. And then I feel like, okay, I just, I'm just going up. I'm just doing my conceptualize as a certain selfie part. This is the, and where I'm putting all my uh, our traditional uh, products which are available in Mustang, just like uh, saligram, uh, ammonite for cells, and that is only available in Mustang. You know. So this is sacred land and I have got lots of conceptual and I work, I work and it's success. So after that, uh, the people I'll hear are like, like little bit hope on the, uh, on me and the women's, you know, I'm feeling still very um, uh, sad for the people, uh, the women in the uh, Mustang region. They are still suppressed by their voice are still suppressed, which is uh, one of the cha most challenging in, uh, in Mustang, even though like they, they contribute lots of um, times in tourism sectors also, they're doing business and they're like, uh, they're handling the international tourism and domestic, but still in the, in the matter of village uh, decision making, they are still uh, very under the below, very below list. Thank you very much. I think one of the, um, before we like totally run out of time, because I, I can ask a lot of questions to all of you, because it's so fascinating. Um, we do need to kind of uh, go into talking a little bit about COVID. I mean, uh, with COVID for the first time ever, we had um, negative oil prices. And is there a possibility of a reversal in terms of the uh, uh, rapid climate change and w w what do you think what should the ideal new norm be um should we start with Fatia? sure um yeah that's that's a very interesting question and i think what we are looking at right now is a very short-term outcome um and as a as someone who knows climate science i think we should look at it as a long-term impact anything that we're looking at we should make sure that if we're looking at the primary pollutant we are aware of the secondary pollutants that would come later in, in, in this discussion. So for example, r right after COVID, we heard and saw so many stories going viral about how our air is clean, how our water uh, bodies are becoming clean. But we need to understand that this cleanliness, this cleansing, this transition is temporary. It is not going to stay like that forever. We also read and heard and saw researchers share with us that the ozone in the stratosphere is increasing or it's healing. And that's why now the ultraviolet radiation should not be able to come, come to us. So that would have improved the environment a little bit. But I think there's so many issues um, associated with COVID-19 as well. And instead of, I think, improving the environment, we are harming it already a lot more. And I think there is a fear that we might end up harming it more. Because if you look at COVID-19's relation with wildlife management, you will see that because of less patrolling and because of, for example, in my village, lesser licenses for people from outside to come and trophy hunt and give money to the community, to the local community, what, my, what has ended up happening is that a lot of people are hunting these uh, species that are at the verge of extinction. So because of less patrolling, that is happening all around the world, and it is an established fact, number one. Number two, we think that the air quality has improved, yet it, it, it has for the smoke or, or the particulate matter 2.5. But the truth is that if you look at some of the other scientific studies, you would see that the nitrogen dioxide and the ozone concentrations are increasing, which we know that because of the industrial shutdown and the vehicular emission um, being stopped, the smog level or the particulate matter le level has come down, but the air quality hasn't yet improved. I think it will only improve 
if we continuously change our actions into the ones that are more environment friendly. And similarly, there are other aspects that are associated to it, it as well, such as agriculture. You would imagine that now there would be more demand for food and therefore perhaps for smaller farmers, life would be better. But we have seen that with climate uh, science and with this locust um, problem with Iran, India and Pakistan, People are saying that this is actually a bigger threat to people than COVID-19. So I think it's bigger and broader than just a small scale change that we are seeing right now. It's going to take a lot of human intervention and human responsibility for us to step up and say that we've been doing things wrong since now, whether it's climate activism, whether it's anything else. So you, I think one thing that is also positive is the fact that we're having this discussion on a virtual medium right now. So less traveling, right? Less air traveling. We, we're having this discussion and so we have got down the carbon dioxide emission a little bit. So it has in a way given us a new direction to maybe carry our con conversations in future because before this we've liked to even carry climate conversations with thousands of delegates coming all, from all across the world with all that carbon dioxide emission that is a part of it and, and people you know asking whether you're actually working towards because I have been a part of meetings where we have, we have all the ACs on um, and the temperature is really, really down, uh, talking about how can we stop climate change in Pakistan. And, and that sort of makes you question your, your um, existence in that room and your uh, value to, to the discussion that, that you're having. So they're both positive and negative uh, ways to look at it. I would like to end it with, uh, with one thing. I think in my region, for example, it has both negative and positive implications. So um, as Lakshmi would know, um, in our region as well, there's been a lot, a lot of economic boost because of local tourism, and that is completely halted right now. So there's literally no means of income. People who had businesses, the businesses are shut down. People who used to travel here and there to, to do small businesses, that is shut down. And so we have very little means of income at the moment. But it is also a blessing in a way that everyone who was living outside of the region has come back to the region. And the little agricultural land that we had which we were ignoring, which was our only source of income long ago, has now become a source of income for us again. It has become a source of livelihood and food for us again. So now you see that the entire family is going out to work on the little piece of land that they have. And this year I saw that because of the Clean and Green Pakistan initiative, we received a lot of trees. And because multiple male members were in the house, they could walk longer distances, they could drive longer distances, and more trees were put in my village than before. So I think they're, they're, they're both positive and negative ways to look at it and I would like to highlight both. So that's that's what I think. Uh, I think, um, is it to, uh, Charmaine, that one of the things that people are floating is like what, how, why COVID-19 happened. So do you believe that the COVID pandemic is a result of environmental change? And does that even make sense? And how does it relate to environmental activism in the future? Is there an upside, um, like the negative, negative oil prices that happened for a while? And is it how difficult is, has it made, uh, made it for you to advance your work? Um, thank you for asking. I don't see actually any relationship between COVID-19 and uh, environmental change, that environmental change triggers uh, uh, this COVID-19 situation. Uh, but the interesting thing is, as we are all locked down and, and uh, uh, being a, uh, being uh, living in Dhaka, in, in the most uh, densely populated city, and, and, and in a small apartment where we can see the skies and the greenery, uh, and the perks are not available, uh, the people now can understand that you know you need to have open spaces you need to have uh, uh, you know greenery and you need to care about the nature the best part of it is is uh, uh, here um, the lives uh, we, we 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 are in very dangerous situation in bangladesh especially in dhaka and, and the vicinity areas uh, uh, the situation is grieving actually uh, still uh, Apart from lives, you know, lives doesn't, you know, nothing is comparable to lost lives. Apart from, apart from lost lives, the economic loss is, is huge. And it's, uh, you know, the in, uh, people are losing their uh, employment, not within the domestic uh, um, sphere, 
also from the overseas as well as the prices of oil are uh, cutting down going down many of our uh, uh, people are working in the middle east and and the european cities and 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 our uh, european uh, you know agriculture side and all that they started coming back so it's a huge impact and in terms of climate change you know when we talk about resilience we we often go to small farm holders small female farmers that you need to understand about the climate vulnerability and the climate resilient crop varieties and all that you need to build up your cultivation on that and uh, you know this uh, tiny little small holders they are now losing their livelihoods they don't have uh, anything to you know the distribution channel is uh, disrupted uh, you, we we have dairy hubs they don't have uh, you know anything to uh, distribute right now so this kind of losses uh, this disrupt the resilience building process so it's uh, it's uh, quite uh, worrisome that uh, uh, yeah our uh, process is uh, disrupting and we need to be with them with uh, special stimulus uh, stimulus packages and we don't know how far this will continue so we need to make contingency plans and we need to be with them with resources uh, with uh, uh, different protocols uh, uh, you know to build up on their resilience you know what i mean i i i have such a long list but i've just been told that we're almost out of time who would have thought about that um thank you so much for this really enlightening and such a timely conversation i hope um quite a few uh future environmentalists will tune in and in fact turn it would be great if everyone tuning in ends up being an environmentalist. Uh, thanks to British Council for getting me involved. Um, personally, I'm going home much wiser. Stay safe and stay healthy. Have a good day. Thank you. I would spend time under the blue whale skeleton in our national museum and it was strung up across the ceiling it's 65 feet long so for a child I mean not that I'm that much taller now but for a child who's like pretty minuscule you're lying under this and you're thinking how does a creature this gigantic exist where does it exist how does it eat how big are its babies When I was 18, I was resolute in the fact that I want to be a marine biologist. Everyone around me was like, but Puta, what are you going to do with this degree? And I was like, but this is an island, why are we questioning it? But it just goes to show our priorities as a nation, despite being an island nation, weren't related to engaging with the ocean in a way that's recreational or in a manner of conservation. It's not an easy ride being a woman in science, um, being a woman from South Asia in science, because certainly for us as a woman, there's all kinds of challenges, everything from being dismissed to, I mean, I've been at meetings where I was too young and too female, so nobody wanted to listen to me, to people being very patronizing about, oh, have your parents given you new permission to do this? Or does your husband mind? Nobody will ask men those same questions. I still go back 
to the museum, I still walk around this skeleton. I tell people to take their children because it's a place where dreams are made. And I think that's kind of remarkable. रेशमी पोशाक नारी गए चपे आभिजात पास पुरुष हृदय भरे उठे प्रतापे सौंदर्य प्रशंसा नारी भूले जाए सुप्त सद से प्रस्थान ग्लानी बे चले गुटी बंदी जीवन नारी प्रस्थान कम्य नये भलोवेसे पुरुष चाय नारी मन बुनते मन खाटे खुटी काटते एक विश्राम शुरू कर नौका पाइते इच्छे हम फिर खाटे ना पारे फिर नारी तुम्हें अपेक्षा करो दीर्घ रजनी शिथिल सीदूर आो रांगे हाथ कांकला जड़िए जदि माझिर मन नीते पर फिर निज मन के थीतु करो तबु तो प्रस्थान करो ना नारी प्रस्थान कम्य नये पुरुष जन्म जान प्रस्थान और नारी ममता तीले तीले जमिए गढ़े तुले भलोबासार मौचा हठात ही से थीतु थका नारी जख मौचा भेगे अथवा गुटी थे प्रजापति प्रस्थान करते चाय प्रस्थान करते चाय मिथ्या संचित भलोबासा थे पुरुष निर्लिप्तता कलार बेड़ी थे तक ममतामयी नारी होटे विश्वास घातनी अथवा अभिशप्त जननी नारी प्रस्थान कम्य नये तई तो समाज ता लटके दे विवेक बेष्टमी सबला नारी के छुड़े फेला है Hi everyone. My name is Nikhat Dad, and I am from Digital Rights Foundation. I um, I also founded the organization. Uh, I also founded uh, Cyber Harassment Helpline in 2016, which is the region's first helpline. Um, and uh, while keeping in mind that we are going through very unprecedented times. Uh, it's a pandemic uh, lots of uncertainties around um i'll be talking about the work that we do at the helpline but also addressing the issue of online violence against young women and girls also sexual harassment in the online space uh during pandemic um we have been hearing news about uh increased domestic violence around the world not just in uh, developing countries and patriarchal societies but also developed societies as well um uh, we have also seen that during lockdown uh, the um, support system the shelters uh, helplines they also suffered a lot um because uh, lots of uh, helplines and uh, shelters uh, they didn't have sops around physical distancing so the immediate reaction was to shut down services uh, everyone was figuring out how to deal with that um, so we at the helpline uh, also um, we had to um, um, follow the sops of lockdown and we had to shut down the helpline which is a toll free number so we have like uh, helpline staff uh, and when we had to shut down the helpline we were figuring out that how we can continue working uh, 
providing keep providing services uh, at the helpline it's uh, more digital security support legal advice and mental health counseling when any victim and survivor face online violence um so when we say online violence uh, against young women and girls what exactly it is um basically it's uh, any abuse uh, hate speech uh, harassment uh, stalking um rape threats that threats so any kind of uh, abuse uh, that i have mentioned and even uh, beyond that when it happens in the online space when it happens on uh, social media platforms that constitute cyber harassment uh in pakistan uh, we are lucky that we have organizations like uh cyber harassment helpline or uh the ministry of human rights also has a helpline uh which uh, try to uh provide services even during lockdown and uh, uh, uh we have we i mean it took us some time to figure out uh to key keep continuing with our services uh, but at the same time what we did that we started giving services through the through emails and through our social media platforms in march and april we found that the cyber harassment basically increased by 189% as compared to the january and february data and uh, it was quite shocking for us because we were not expecting that lots of people were, were, uh, were uh, will reach out to us um, but at the same time young women and girls across pakistan reached out to us uh, to seek support um, during lockdown uh, not just the domestic violence increased but also the online violence increased uh, in different forms uh, we found at the helpline that uh, mostly it was um uh, non consensual use of intimate images so blackmailing over those images non consensual use of information um and unsolicited contact all these are criminalized in the prevention of electronic crimes act and we have a law enforcement authority which is called cyber crime wing uh so uh, at the helpline we have been providing these services and support to the victims but it's very important that we as society know that uh, online violence is as serious as offline violence and when violence happens or occurs online uh, that hinders uh, uh, women's other freedoms like access to the uh, internet access to the education access to knowledge so access to internet is not just an access to an online space it's an access to knowledge so it's important to acknowledge that this violence happens uh, please know that you are not alone and there are these services like our helpline that you can reach out to thank you i am pranika kuyu i am poet and activist from nepal my poems are basically um, personal experiences of having to grow as a girl child adolescent female and young woman in nepal uh, which has very um, patriarchal values uh, which is very patriarchal in nature the society um, so i consciously started to write poetry to express um uh to express these emotions or these experiences uh since 2009 but before that it just used to be a poem in general so we can say that it became my tool for activism since 2009 and i had to write pretty infamous poems also for which i'm not very happy that i had to write those but the need of an hour asked for it and at such a poem is called um bam an invitation to bam dev gautam which was actually a slam poem directed at uh, the um, deputy prime minister and the home minister of 2015 bam dev gautam is his name and he, and that was also in response to uh response to him saying in the parliament that rape is normal in transition phase of a country that nepal is uh, going nepal was going through at that time uh i'm not very happy that i have to write such uh such po- such such poems or such articles but but I, you somebody has to 
and then though it's unpleasant, I, I do it. Um, and my work basically as a human rights professional uh, is mostly with um, women who are in political parties, who are pursuing their political aspirations and um, representation of women in media, how their voices are heard, how the media portrays them and how much of space is given to them in what way. Uh, that is my interest. And um, the other, other area of interest is that the women who were assaulted during uh, conflict, during the 10-year-old conflict that Nepal had, um, that is my other area of work. And I feel very strongly about it because um, the actual space, the actual concern, the actual voice that should be given to this issue has not been really taken up by not only the state but also the political parties, including the one that was um, that was the rebelling, you know, like that was the that was the rebel, the Maoist uh, during the ten-year-old conflict that Nepal went through. Um, like I am also a researcher and I also do interpretation. So through this, uh, through this work of mine, every uh, community, every individual that I come across, uh, my observations and my understanding of their issues uh, is, you know, like through that, I do understand what the problem is. And I do uh, do the analysis, but I think that this is what most of us do anyway, understating, I mean like stating the problem and analyzing it. But I think we have to go a step further, which is also to take action um, from, you know, like also to take the action, do your bit. Do not just be happy with just writing a report or just, you know, like uh, giving a speech. You need to act. Um, and if anybody says that they are an activist or that they are rights professional or that they are development professionals, I think um, when you talk about social justice or when you say you are working, uh, you know, like you are working for social justice along the feminist principles, then um, like just knowing the problem is not enough. You have to act and you have to act now. And that is what I think I'm committed to. Uh, whether I was the uh, human rights uh, interpreter and then the human rights officer later on with uh, OHCHR, which is the officer of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, the UN human rights body. Uh, I was also the advocacy coordinator with Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact in Thailand. Um, and also I was one of the campaigners of a 107-day youth-led campaign in Kathmandu, which is called Occupy Balwatar. That was in 2012. Um, and this was a campaign where, like, uh, you know, like youngsters in Kathmandu, when they came to hear about what the officials of uh, immigration department had done to one migrant worker uh, who was traveling in a, um, in a false passport, uh, instead of taking legal action against her, uh, what they did was uh, really out of the line. They took her money and she was handed over to the police constable who raped her. Uh, so we were demanding uh, not only a speedy, um, a speedy court process for her, like uh, to decide her case, but there were other four other cases um, which included violence against women, like which revolved around violence against women. And so we were demanding justice uh, from the government. Moreover, we were demanding accountability uh, from the government officials. And uh, we wanted the state to end this impunity that if you are a government official, then you can uh, let go. You know? so, so from all of these experiences, my writings, be it a poem or a prose or a you know, journal article, all I want to do is, I, I mean, somebody has said that I'm a provocative uh, person, uh, I'm like, and that my writings provoke people. Uh, yes, um, I like to provoke people, but not in a destructive way. But I like people to reflect on, on things happening around them and see like, how they can 
you know, like what their role is uh, to address that situation and how they can act. Um, and that is what I have been doing so far. And I think I'll be doing that for a quite long time. Namaste, this is Shaili Basnayad, all the way from Nepal. I have been a part of a very special women team. We climbed Everest in the year 2008. After that big climb, we uh, formed the Seven Summits women team and I became the coordinator of the team. Uh, in 2014, we became the first female group in the world to climb the highest peak in each continent. Now, in this journey, we thought mountaineering was going to be the toughest bit. But to tell you the truth, uh, money was at times more challenging than mountaineering because we all come from very middle class or low income families, um, no big names, no, no big support, so to speak. So there were times when it was very, very difficult uh, for us. And we'd always, you know, complain or let's say hope, wish that things were better for us. Um, that, you know, the whiny bit, so if I may say that, changed in me and uh, my teammates when we started working with a very special group of young women. Uh, in late 2014, uh, we met a group of young uh, females who are survivors of sex trafficking. Uh, they come from you know poorer parts of Nepal where they couldn't even have a proper access to education and other, um, other means of bettering life. As a result, there were traffickers who lured them or, them or their families um, into um, promises of you know, better livelihood, better education. It's a long story, but to cut it short, um, young girls as young as 12, even 9, 15 were trafficked. Um, somehow they managed to make it back to Nepal, but their struggles didn't end there because now there's social stigma against them um, and they don't know how to make money, how to uh, live a dignified life, uh, how to build a career. So when we met them, my teammate Maya and I decided that maybe our mountaineering skills, our knowledge of the tourism industry can help the Survivor Sisters. So we started training them and um, I'm very happy to share that uh, some of our survivor sisters have been very successful. They work as like high altitude guides, you know, making a good amount of living, finally out of poverty for good, have completely transformed their lives. Uh, one of the survivor sisters now works with us helping other survivor sisters. So this has been a journey that started as a personal challenge from Everest, but now is a platform where women can find true economic empowerment so that they can find a true dignified life. Besides, I'm also into stand-up comedy. Uh, my goal is to uh, develop and bring this powerful female narrative to this whole global entertainment, uh, like the one I just talked about, but in a funny way. Um, and that's been my journey. I know I used to complain, but now I know that even the right to complain is a privilege. Hope we can all use what we have to create a better world for our sisters. Thank you. Hello and thank you for joining us on Project Women Way. My name is Promina Shrestha and I'm an illustrator and a researcher for South Asian art, especially focusing on Nepal. Today we have with us four women artists from South Asia who are all part of the Creating Heroines project. Creating Heroines is a British council program that brings together women artists from South Asia and the UK to explore the themes of overlooked heroines from the past and imagined heroines from, for the future. The program aims to spark debate, challenge stereotypes and share women's stories you can find out more about Creating Herons at the British Council's website. Project Woman Way is a multimedia experience that brings together four women artists from South Asia into a conversation where they will talk about ideas of ideal heroines, taking cue from women they love, admire, and look up to. In today's conversation, our artists will be specially focusing on the perception of body image and how they challenge and defy constructed ideals and stereotypes for women in their work. Today in conversation, we have Humaira Kabir from Bangladesh, Michelle Lama from Nepal, Yamina Pirzada from Pakistan, and Irushi Tenakun from Sri Lanka. 
My name is Humaira Kopi. I'm a visual artist based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I mostly like to work with traditional media such as watercolor, gouache and acrylic, but I also like doing digital illustrations. For my styles, I'd have to say I like experimenting with new kinds of styles, but mostly I like flowy shapes and complementing colors in my works. I like to explore personal themes that hold significance to me, but I also work with social stigmas and social taboos and try to use my art as something to change the social perceptions of things that we still consider taboo, but that shouldn't be. I believe art has power and I want to use mine to inspire good changes in the world. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Irushi Tenakun. I am an illustrator and animator based in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Um, I'm currently working on an animated series as part of my Creating Heroines um, grant project as part of the Creating Heroines workshop uh, last year in February 2019 in Kathmandu. And uh, since then, I've been working on a project where I've interviewed a group of women and I'm retelling their stories through animation. Hi, my name is Michelle Lama. I'm a multicultural kid. Um, I uh, am currently based in Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm a multidisciplinary visual artist and I work in mediums such as paper uh, cutting, uh, illustration, collage. Uh, I've been currently working on a long-term project called Art Aid Nepal, and where we work with children uh, to empower them through the means of art. I was also working with Virangana um, Comics, where we're working doing illustrations as a feminist collective. Um, and 2019, I was also working with uh, Creating Heroines, Hi, I'm Yamina Pirzaga. I'm an actress and a puppeteer and a puppet maker. I was part of WOW uh, in 2017 uh, in Karachi, where I was part of a workshop uh, titled Creating Heroines, where we got a lot of kids to create puppets of people that they found inspiring, uh, be it uh, celebrities or someone within their own families or themselves, uh, whatever they thought was uh, a hero, a heroine to them. And then I co-led a puppet making workshop with a Scottish artist uh, for the Wow Perth in Scotland, which was titled My Body, My Voice. And that was again, um, that was a workshop for adults, uh, not uh, so much focused on children. And that was again for people to accept the uniqueness of one's bodies and uh, just celebrate that. Thank you ladies for joining us today. My first question to you guys is, does your immediate environment and culture have an impact on your body image in terms of mental state or physical appearance? Thank you, Pramina. I think that's a very important question and something that I think all women and artists can relate to. I think my immediate in environment definitely has an impact on my work as well as my body image. I don't know how much it has impacted my physical impact image or how I put myself forth into the world but when it goes for my mental state it has definitely affected me since I was young there had been all these ideas around me about what it means to be a girl and what it means to be a boy and I didn't fit into that box so obviously since I didn't fit into that girly box I thought that my only credibility is that I had to be tomboyish I can't like girly things I have to like all the things that boys like so that even if I can't be pretty, I can still be cool. And as I have grown up, I have realized how wrong that idea was. I don't have to just pick one side or the other. And now that I like all sorts of things, I like pan shirts, which in my culture is considered still a very much masculine thing. And I still like frocks and I like makeup and I have found a middle ground that I'm very comfortable with. And I think in this topic, it would be very relevant to also refer to the work that I'm doing today, where I am drawing my heroines, who is based on the concept of my five maternal figures. Even when the society had made me feel very unworthy of um, people being attracted to me as a woman or as a girl, they have always told me I was beautiful. And that is something that I am really focusing on today's work as well. Thank you. 
in Sri Lanka and I think in most South Asian countries, we have uh, a spectrum of, of skin tones and skin colors. And in terms of um, Sri Lankan people, I think I fall into a, a fairer skin sort of category. And um, I mean, this is something I've faced my whole life, but I think I'm becoming a little more conscious um, now that, I mean, looking back, uh, there were instances when I was little tutors would come to teach us and they would look at my parents and think that they were the nannies or working working at home or something and then they'll ask, they'll ask my parents where my parents were so there's um, and then growing up I noticed when we would ever like when we would go to hotels or if we would go on holiday somewhere in Sri Lanka will have different treatment because uh, they would consider me foreign or something like that, which is something that I just got used to and I didn't try to question uh, as much. And I think it's, um, uh, again, uh, if you're darker skin, there's that perspective, the opposite perspective also of where you can be treated less nicely or um, that sort of thing. Um, having, having said that, um, I've begun exploring it through my art very recently uh, and uh, through my animation and through my illustrations because I've also um, mainly been exposed to Western literature and Western film and Western animation. And when I started out with my illustration work, I tried to copy that in a sense. I would draw Sri Lankan people with white skin and I would try to draw my animated characters with fairer skin. And I feel like I wasn't really conscious of where I was. I wasn't present. I wasn't um, uh, conscious as a South Asian and a Sri Lankan and that's been a very recent realization for me where I've tried to explore different um, skin colors through my art and animation. Being multinational uh, in a country that again is I think you know it does look at whether you're fair skin, dark skin, things like that in in subtle ways that there, it, it's prominent in certain ways that um, I, you know, I never really fit in as a local, you could say like as a local, but then at the same time I am. So always growing up this idea of like, oh, where are you from? Like, you're not Nepali, you don't speak Nepali, do you? And that does have an impact on, I think, how I perceived myself as a little girl here so in the beginning it was always oh I'm I'm never like anybody that is in my surrounding uh, in my surroundings but then as I got older I think how I chose to dress myself was because I felt I was always already an outsider that um, I I stopped caring about how people perceived me so then it did impact the way I dressed, the way I maybe carried myself in certain ways. But then the older you get, you realize that it doesn't really matter so much. It's about how you relate to people on an emotional level. And so through my art, I think in the beginning, it was never really about, uh, I never wanted to express um, I, like myself as, uh, or identify myself with my art because it was already so different. So trying to find a way because finding a balance between who you are already within the society you live. And so, I mean, in regards to my work, I definitely say that uh, uh, who I was and how I uh, perceived myself was very separated from my work. But now as I've matured and I've gotten older, I think it's easier to now work on things like identity and things like um, individuality or society and how they play a part together. One thing specifically that affected me, but I think it affects every Pakistani woman with especially the skin tone, uh, we call it uh, the Gora complex. Gora means fair and uh, everyone refers to it as that. So I think like uh, Arushi said uh, in Sri Lanka, I'm sure that it's, it's a similar thing. That here we have uh, a very famous um, skin whitening cream called Fair and Lovely. And uh, automat it's called Fair and Lovely, you see. And it's, it, was, it wasn't for men for years. And then I think years later, India came up with something like Fair and Handsome. But in Pakistan, it's always been, I remember 
everyone always putting it on. It's very recent, like the last decade that people have started saying, you know, it's literally after social media and all this awareness and I'm sure such talks. And that last decade, I felt that no one um, indulges in it so much. But growing up, when I was a teenager, it was something everyone had. And uh, so that thing that I think where it affected my psyche, uh, not so much because like my mother is very, very fair skinned and my father is uh, quite brown and tan and I'm, I'm in the middle. So we never saw it like that. We'd, uh, we'd seen it in our family and everyone has a different skin shade. But till today, uh, none of the girls I know or my, you know, we don't swim when the sun is really out there because, oh, we're going to get tan. So a lot of times automatically, if it's really sunny and I want to swim, I'd be like, oh, I'll wait till five. So that's where it affects your psyche. Not obviously that I don't feel worthy enough or pretty enough, but it's, it's so subtle that we're avoiding swimming at a time because for years you felt, oh, but I'm going to get so tan. And I've never seen the men, uh, like my husband, I mean, he would swim at any time, you know, it doesn't matter. So it's a very female it's for the women that the men can be dark. They can go, they'd be playing cricket out in the afternoon. I've never heard a man say, oh, I'm going to get dark. But it's, uh, for us, it's uh, the sport and swimming and being out in the lawn. Or it's always back of your mind. It's this, um, it's this complex of fairness. So I think in that way, very subtly, it affects you, but not, uh, not so obvious. Moving on. Uh, do you like? Uh, do you think there's a consciousness by artists to represent different types of bodies in present day as compared to like a decade ago before social media took over everything, or do artists still subconsciously, like Irushi mentioned before, you know, perpetuate that idealism of bodies? I think a lot of artists still do not take the cue that we should be promoting body positivity or body inclusivity. Um, like Yushu mentioned that she has recently in the past few years have started seeing it in her works and doing her part to make it better, make it more inclusive. Um, I still see a lot of artists who don't do that. Um, if I talk about myself when I was younger, I used to draw myself. I recently found an old sketchbook where I saw that every time I drew myself, I was this slim, long-haired, feminine woman, which was not me. I had all this short hair. I was chubby. So that was somebody else. But there was the name Ava written beside it. So as I grew older, I started seeing myself really that I let go of the idea that I will someday be slim and pretty and long-haired. I say pretty here in, a, in the conventional way. Now that I'm older, I know I'll never be that, but I'm still pretty. I love myself now, so I don't have to draw that dream image of myself anymore. I can draw myself and can still say, yeah, that's a wonderful picture. I look nice. Um, in recent times, a lot of artists have been doing that. They're doing inclusive drawings and sculptures. And in media also, we see some representation, but I'll say it's nearly not enough. But I think to answer your question directly, I wouldn't say all artists are liable or they have to do it, this inclusivity or body image issues that they're addressing. But it would be nice that if they did, I don't want it to come out as an activism that they have to do it because it's the right thing to do. I just want it to come naturally when they're drawing five women, two of them should naturally be rounder maybe one of them should naturally have darker skin maybe four of them should have darker skin it's not something that we should have to consciously think about i think a lot of the artists the sri lankan artists that that i follow on social media they are dealing with um with certain issues around their environment and i mean we've just come out of a 30 year long civil war and there are people who are addressing the i mean and it's not it doesn't mean that this is peacetime there are still repercussions and there are still a lot of problems that the country is facing and i see artists dealing with that 
But um, coming back to body image, I think it's also, it's something that comes with maturity as well, accepting yourself and then being able to reflect it in your art. Um, Because I'm, uh, I just turned 30 and um, this is something that I discovered last year. So it took me quite a long time, I think, to sort of accept myself and accept the world around me. Well, having said that, I think, um, there are still a lot of artists, uh, I mean, like Humera mentioned, again, it's not that you, you should force yourself to say, okay, we are Sri Lankans, we need to draw ourselves accurately, this is our responsibility, uh, art should be a form of activism. It doesn't necessarily always have to be that. But again, I think through these subtle changes, we are changing a narrative. We are accepting ourselves. We are dealing with our countries as maybe post-colonial in, in various, in a multiplicity of settings. And um, we're trying to, I think, break some of those veils that are blinding us uh, in terms of art. Um, and in terms of my art, I would say I have made a conscious decision when I'm making my animation cl- uh, puppets out of clay to mix a little extra black into my orange to make it to make it a darker shade of brown, or um, you know that sort of thing. Because the heroines that I've I've created in my animated series are not these, you know, not what you see on on uh, on film. So they're just average, everyday Sri Lankan women who have achieved something great. And I've tried, I've tried my best to break break those uh, boxes. I really agree with the, uh, Irushi right now, actually, because I think in this day and age, things are really changing and evolving. And social media, I mean, it is what you're exposed to at the same time and what you also in certain ways choose to look for. But I think social media, you know, we have the world at our fingertips in certain ways. So uh, especially for the younger generations, they do have access to all forms of body type. So I think when when I was growing up, I felt that it was this idea that you had this, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, really tall, skinny person. But they didn't really fairly represent people of different color, shape, size, figures, you know, like none of it was. But now within art on social media, I see so many uh, artists, uh, you know, female artists, especially representing women in so many different ways. And compared to when we were growing up, I think it has really changed. It It's definitely out there, I think. And in terms of how, um, you know, that affects somebody and how that affects how you view yourself it definitely um, for me it's nice to see you know you go through something on the internet and you see another woman that's going through the same experience as you it it has such a positive effect on you because you don't feel so isolated and alone like am I the only one going through this but you realize most women are going through the same sort of things and they kind of are we have similar experiences it, no matter where in the world. It's really interesting that when it comes to art, like installations and drawings and illustrations and puppet making and stop motion and which is all uh, this sort of medium, I feel, yes, things are shifting uh, because more and more artists are, uh, you know, like Michelle just said and Rushi just said, you get to view so, uh, so much work. Uh, of other artists so easily. It's so easily accessible. But at the same time, uh, when it comes to, um, since I'm an actress and a puppeteer, it's really interesting. At the same time with media, I think it's regressing. And again, uh, because it, because of social media, if one or two um, actors or celebrities or get a lot of, uh, they get they have a huge following or people admire the way they look, automatically that also becomes a benchmark for all the younger ones to think, oh, uh, this is the way we should look. Or let me post a picture like that, I'm going to get so many likes. Or if I do this, I'll get this project. So one way with the social media and all, uh, in one way you can see different people and celebrate everyone's uniqueness and uh, this diversity. And at the same time, the negative is um, you start uh, kind of, making them your ideals, a few people. And again, it limits the concept of beauty. 
So it's yeah. very, it's very strange that uh, in one way, this, you know, it's so much, you have so much more to offer and people are more accepting of yeah. themselves. And then there's that whole filter. Uh, let's put a beauty filter. Let's um, hide this or crop it up and just yeah. post or remove the blemish. Uh, so again, you're just showing a version of, uh, uh, you know, like a fantasy or something of yourself. Again, hiding further from yourself. Moving on. Um, do you believe how you perceive yourself, uh, your own body image, affects how people view you and your work? And does this in turn, in turn affect your work? Like how you perceive yourself, does it affect your work? And does it also affect the choice in your artwork in terms of theme or media or materials that you guys use? I've tried drawing myself. I've been drawing, drawing myself in cartoon form for a while. Uh, just everyday things. I, I teach English, so I've drawn comics about um, just my everyday instances running around with files in the rain, forgetting an umbrella. So I've drawn little funny clips of myself uh, through my work. But I think, um, I think I've gone a step further now to sort of draw uh, people that are not myself, but people I see around me, the, the various issues around me through animation and illustration form. Um, so it's not, I, I don't think, uh, for me at least, it's not always about drawing myself, but, but just drawing maybe how I feel about the things around me. Uh, so that's what I've been working on. I'll start with saying that I think how people perceive me has definitely shaped my art because I often work with issues that have personal significance to me and I always work with words that people have said to me mostly that have either hurt me or made me feel nice. That is a very strong point of where my inspiration comes from, I think. So when I do my arts, definitely others' perceptions has shaped it. For example, I have a very favorite painting where I have drawn myself naked holding my cat. And it has pitch bubbles all around it where it has things people have said to me, questioned me about my sexuality, about my religious beliefs, and about my body, about everything really. Just question my self-confidence into who I am. So I have drawn this painting as a way to let everyone see and reassure myself that I don't have to worry about what they think about me. It cannot touch me. It's just stuck in their bubbles because their thoughts are stuck in a bubble still. So just like that, I think it's not that I always draw the negative things that people say to me. Sometimes I do that to let out the negative energy inside me. But I have also drawn plenty of things that have made me feel so beautiful. I thought the only way to cope with it is to just put it on a paper, as dramatic as it sounds. <laughs> um, and I guess um, how people perceive me because of this um yes the answer to that would also be yes because i have drawn things in the past that like i said just a while before the inspiration comes from what people say to me and i think um if we take the example of the painting that i just talked about after i have drawn it when people saw it and they understood that their harmless remarks were not as harmless as they think their perception of me changed their uh, some people have actually come up to me and said, I'm really sorry that I've said those things to you. I shouldn't have. And I'm glad that you brought it to my attention. So I think by doing this painting, not only have I reassured myself, but people have also started seeing me in a new light. Have you ever been through an instance where you were forced to rethink the perception of yourself in women's bodies? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I think, yeah, when I, was, uh, when I was younger and starting out, uh, about I think when I was 20 and we'd done like a short film or I would often have people say or I did a modeling shoot when I was 18 and you know I had the photographers a few times say oh just three-fourths of the face not her complete profile because she, she has a prominent nose so at the age of 18 you're a bit like you, you don't know so I think when you're that young uh, again, there's nothing right or wrong about your own features. But yes, when a third person is telling you only photograph a certain way, 
then you start thinking, oh, really? Because you've never thought about it. So I think that is when you start thinking. And I was never, I was always very slim. And so I never had um, bodily, um, I wasn't uh, ever, ever thought about it because I was in fact just very slim and always into dancing and theater. And so those things never came my way. But only when I was older, with the screen a few times people said oh that your right side and then your left until today I don't know which side because it was never my focus and a lot of people learn the art of uh, where the light should hit their face and where which angle they look prettier from but I never quite understood that and it's only when you hear these things I think slowly slowly you do doubt oh, oh maybe I'm sitting on my right or oh, maybe I'm sitting on your left but I, I've always tried to not let it affect me so much. And that's why I'm still a little, you know, um, I never got uh, affected that uh, badly compared to a lot of actors and stuff. But it's only instances like this when someone has said it that you do end up thinking. Um, I definitely think there have been a lot of instances where you start to really look at who you are to, and what what does it mean to be a woman because I remember as uh, like when I was a lot when I was really small I was always very tomboyish very athletic you know always on the running team things like that and very flat chested and so I remember that you know uh, we'd go trekking with my father things like that and they go Oh, uh, oh, you have a son and a daughter because I'm with my sister. She's older than me. So, oh, you're with your son and your daughter because, you know, I was tomboyish if I was wearing a cap or something. And then you start to question, like, what does it mean really to be a woman? Is it because I'm wearing like a T-shirt and some shorts that I look like a little boy? And then, you know, I hit puberty and then my breasts come and all of a sudden you can't really do the things that you were doing when you were younger because exactly. your body has changed. And then, and then also the way people start perceiving you is so different. So, you know, your own perception of you changes as well. Cause before you're this young tomboyish kind of, you know, free spirited. And then you have this restriction all of a sudden, cause you have breasts, you, you, you have a, a curve, you have anything. And it really changes the way you behave and the way I think you look at yourself also. Because for me personally, it really did from, I, you know, I stopped running or being on the running team. I, I stopped swimming as much and I was, swim I really stopped swimming because I felt, you know, oh, it's, I'm ashamed almost of now that I have, you know, prominent breasts, like a figure that is more feminine in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And it really changes the way you look at yourself. But as you get older, you realize it's just natural and then you learn to adapt to mm. accepting your own body over time, right? I would like to jump in and comment on, just sort of expand on what Michelle said and look at how, how that idea of body image and puberty and change and how people view women, how that is um, sort of expressed through art. Something that I've become more aware about and I've tried to explore through my art and my animation is that I've um, consciously tried not to make my characters curvy. Like I said, I've tried to make my characters a little darker skin to represent who they really are. And at the same time, I've um, tried not to mold these perfect curvy figures. They're just, mm. and, you know, I've been um, just... Uh, I've tried to have my my clay the my my thumbprints on them and just make them very rough and almost true to life and more relatable. And in a sense, if you look at some of the best artists, I think they don't really try to represent women or the human body in general accurately, especially mm. when children's artists. They're very. Uh, I don't know, it's almost like a very free flowing style of illustration that is more relatable than if you see something drawn very realistically. And um, I think, especially in terms of creating characters that are South Asian, if you do try to adapt that style, the free flowing style, the uh, not conforming to any specific shape or form, but 
but making them more relatable. I think we are changing the narrative through our mm-hmm. satellites in a sense, and also creating a multiplicity of narratives that are more relatable and maybe we'll change the whole story uh, in generations to come with our tiny actions, hopefully. Yeah, I'd like to say that um, it's fascinating, well, horribly fascinating that even though we're from completely different backgrounds, I completely relate with Yamina and Michelle on both the instances where when I was younger with my older brother, everyone would say that my mother has two sons because they wore shirts and they had short Mm -hmm. hair. When I went out with my brother, um, for a whole year, actually, my brother's friends didn't even know that I was a girl. They just assumed that I'm his younger brother. That was it. And as I grew older, when, (laughs) as Michelle eloquently put it, when my breasts came out, (laughs) I couldn't do this anymore. (laughs) Because you can't wear a shirt anymore because it shows your figure. You can't go out to play with the boys because they'll see your hips. They're carvier now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just, um, there are so many women who goes to the same thing and it's not talked about enough. I know about my aunt who was an excellent sportswoman in school, but she had to stop because her body was changing and the family didn't allow it anymore. And just like Yamina said when, Little things can change your perception about your body, which was your original question. When I was in school, I heard my friend and my other friend talking about how if I went on the stage to dance, the stage would break because I was overweight. They didn't know that I overheard it. And that Mm -hmm. one sentence actually um, changed my whole perception of who I was, how much weight I had. Suddenly I felt like I have to step lightly. Even to this day, when I go to a wedding and the bride and groom invite me up to take photos with them. The first thing I think is, where should I step? What if the stage breaks? That would be embarrassing. <laughs> the best thing that happened to you. Did it affect your art as well? In my art, I think not like this. Because at that age when these things happened, I wasn't really thinking about what's happening around me affecting my art. Um, if you're talking about the change of perception in art, that was actually a positive one. After I found all the curvier and inclusive models on Instagram, that has drastically changed how I see myself and how I draw myself. So that was a wonderful thing. When I draw myself now, I don't try to slim myself down or be fuller hair. I just draw it as it is because I have gotten that confidence from their accounts, from the influencers that I can be pretty however I am. Thank you. So, um, about a year ago, I got together with a few creating heroines artists, which also includes Michelle, and we started this thing called Rangana Comics. We actually started it for fun. How, and one of our first issues was on self-love. So one of the cues, so every, all the artists, we had eight, eight women artists, they created this thing, comics about uh, self-love, where some were talking about their mothers, some were talking about more metaphysical things. Me, I was talking about, for instance, I was talking about loving myself you know, from my own self, not having somebody to love me. Mm. In that, and it actually influenced a lot of people and people came to us and said, oh, you know, it makes me love myself or it supports me. And they said that we were inspirational as women and as artists. In that regard, I wanted to ask all of you, um, what, as artists and as women and as human beings, what or who supports your uh, self-perceptions of your own body images? I'd have to say my family that comes first. Um, For me, self-love was a very tricky road and always an uphill battle. Even now I have days when I struggle to love myself as I am. But even when I did not believe in myself and did not love myself, even when I hated to look in the mirror, my family has always loved me. Even on days when I actually wouldn't want to look at myself, my, mam- my family said, you're the most beautiful girl ever. And they actually believed it. It's, they said it with conviction. So I think without their help when I needed it, I wouldn't be here today loving myself and loving what I do. So it took me a while to get to the point to appreciate them for what they said and how they behaved. But now that I look back, that was something that I really needed when I was younger. I think I completely agree with Humera in the sense that my parents have always just 
I don't know, maybe even given me a blind sense of confidence saying, you know, you're, you're beautiful and don't worry. And uh, whenever I had little anxieties about how I would look, especially when we started going for all these little parties and all that, at that age, I, I would be very conscious about maybe, maybe some of you have that in common as well, especially when we start going for all these girl boy parties and uh, mm-hmm. it was, uh, I was quite a tomboy and then it was very weird for me at first to, to wear jewelry and that sort of thing. Um, but again, my parents had my back and, um, and since then, I think uh, even my husband has also played a big role because I would constantly be asking him, am I chubby? I haven't exercised in so long. Do I look okay? And um, <laughs> I'm going to have to jump in with you, Shared, that I have to give a shout out to my husband. He believes that I hold the star in my hand. So <laughs> I want to thank him for being himself. He has always been there for me and never lets me forget that I should be loving myself first. Yeah, but I mean, something that he always says is, so what if you're, if you're chubby, just own it, you know, own your body. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> good you know so um so since then i think i've felt a little more confident even doing this video and i, I thought it was just going to be an art but when i realized we are going to be seen i had a bit of a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but yeah definitely family and close friends have just always been checking up and making sure we're we're okay so i think we need to make a network for ourselves also <laughs> A little tough to do it alone, accepting yourself. So having having that network of close people is important. Virangana also started for networking because we're usually alone and we lack the confidence. So it actually helped us. It created a solidarity amongst us and telling each other how beautiful we are and how smart we are. Works definitely. And I think all of you are very beautiful people. I wanted to ask, um, does this then also affect your works of arts? I think that once you, you know, once you start actually having a little more belief in yourself and a little more confidence in yourself, you also have confidence in what you do in general, even if it, in any subject of what you're making, right? And it really does impact, I think, how you draw. Because I know that when I have something like where I cannot create and I cannot make something it's also when my self-confidence is really lacking so you know at the start of the lockdown I had a really hard time um, creating anything and it was also before the lockdown I was going through quite a difficult period myself so then that had such a huge impact on on um, what I created and you know all of the art was very let's say dark and uh, you know, I, I remember one time I had a, a drink and what I created that was like a self-portrait was a really kind of strange visualization of how I saw myself. And, you know, like that was my representation of what I was feeling at the time. But as as you feel better, your art also, I think, broadens and your 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 confidence in what you can create becomes so much wider. So you're able to uh, play around with what you do in a more kind of, I think, positive way. Whereas if it's if you have constantly this negative image of yourself maybe it is uh, coming out in the art and it is a way to release it but it definitely does impact the work I think. I think like since everyone uh, sorry earlier was talking about how their family has uh, supported them and I think it's really the conversations that are around you. I never really grew up with like my mother's a beautiful beautiful woman and my sister is beautiful and you know she has lighter skin and green eyes and but in our family, uh, the focus was never so much, the conversations on the dining table was never on beauty. So I think we didn't, growing up, whether one is skinny or one is chubby or someone is fairer or darker, or I never remember my father talking about looks ever. I never just remember my mother. It was till today we were discussing drama and literature and a movie or puppetry. And so much of the focus was on these ideas that was, that is why with me, I never, um, now I see today girls, my younger sister is 14, uh, my half sister. And uh, 
she is so much younger and when i see her friends in the conversation i feel they're much younger and it's all about they're more affected by how their body um uh, body image and uh, what society uh, puts on them but i feel when we were younger maybe it has a lot to do with the conversations around uh, the focus was not so much we didn't have so many external uh you know we didn't have social media platforms and it was really your day your school and what you're making and then you go and sleep so i thought i was the queen <laughs> you know i i thought it was uh, you know i grew up with almost this crazy confidence even though i was the shortest girl in class uh with really really uh, dora the explorer kind of hairstyle but i thought there was no one better than me uh you know it's only uh much much later when you're like oh is this person thinks that of me or i never looked at myself like that so i think it's really uh what the atmosphere you create for people's uh, insecurities and to overcome them i wanted to ask something because uh i recently wrote a paper on feminist comics in nepal and how comics can be a part of activism so i was wondering with without like consciously being activistic i wanted to know whether um you think that the kind of artworks you do uh whether they also function consciously or subconsciously as forms of activism for body positivity i wouldn't go as far as to say that my art or i myself identify as acts of activism but i definitely think that essence is there because when i work with things about uh, body image or social taboos like for example there are certain ways that we expect in our society for men and women to look if they don't behave in a certain way we give them names that are often very derogatory which are something that i speak out through my arts and the acceptance of differently built women um so when i draw these things i wouldn't say i'm doing it from the sense of activism just to open people's eyes to these issues i do them because they're close to my heart but by doing these and opening them to viewers i think at least subtly it is influencing people to be more accepting because you don't always have to shout from the rooftop about an issue you keep showing something to people you keep normalizing something no matter how slowly and steadily it does become normalized so i think even though the sense of activism is there i wouldn't be feel comfortable calling myself an activist but i definitely want to keep doing it and nudge the society in the right way if possible i am in addition to being an illustrator and animator my academic background is in english studies and i and i've been teaching english at university for the last couple of years um so i feel like um through both these things through my art and through uh the the education aspect i've been trying again like mara said not in a bold way maybe that comes from my sort of introverted personality that um i look at people who are uh the shouty from the rooftop kind of activists and i admire them and i'm almost jealous of them and i wish i could uh speak out like them sometimes but again um we are changing i think through our small work through little things in education and through our art um I feel like each step is a different thing because I've had people come up to me and said oh my gosh you you do you uh, you're an artist for a living how how does that work you don't have to be you know you don't have to be in a conventional job and you're still doing okay you're paying your bills and you're surviving so i mean i think just putting our art art out there is also people re- like it's a realization for some people to to see being an artist is is a real job as well so uh, in a sense that has been important it has been challenging stereotypes about skin color challenging stereotypes about women and certain professionals and um and i think uh, and profi- and i mean talking about professionals i think i'm also questioning myself because um in the sense that um in in the way that people perceive artists as professionals uh by seeing my work even though i'm not drawing myself necessarily 
uh, or showing my body. Um, I think my my body of work, in a sense, um, does speak um, in terms of that. Yeah, I wouldn't call it again like um, Arushi and Amara, like uh, uh, that I'm an activist, but I do think that, uh, especially in puppetry, uh, I think puppetry has, uh, what I noticed that puppetry has such a power because already uh, it is an inanimate object. So people don't have a preconceived idea. You can have a crocodile, you can have a mouse, you can have a blue person, a purple person. And I feel just through that, you're actually um, already giving the idea of diversity and acceptance to children. So I think a lot of um, my work with puppetry um, really, I think, helped me also. You know, you, you create so many different characters and you become more accepting. And I think it's, it's literally that subtle that you don't show a certain princess or a prince. So you just show diverse characters with different sizes and shapes and skin tones. Um, we made, you know, this... Uh, there was a love story I did with a French woman and both the puppets were made out of newspaper. So there was no, there is no skin color and the audience was glued watching it. And then that makes you think that it's much more, it's the emotion, not how you look. So I think puppetry really, for me, uh, has really worked in um, making people more acceptable of differences. So it's really that small, but the more you show them, uh, I think that creates the openness. Um, I would go off like what you were saying, what Yamino is saying about working with children, right? And changing a child's perspective. So in terms of activism, or I mean, I wouldn't call it activism, but education, you know, and, and with the project we were working on with Art Aid, where we had uh, created a a uh, book of nine different stories of nine different women from all different walks of life um, in Nepal. And, you know, there were women that helped change Nepal. And, you know, they were all female artists um, made these small comics. And in the end, you know, you go into a school and you, you're a team of women teaching young boys and girls. And the perception they have already, well, from reading one, this book, it's uh, the book, but also just you have female artists and um, the people we work, the people I was working with, they all do different things. And but it's it's still nice that they look up to uh, women that are artists and the same idea of like, oh, you're you're an artist, you make a living as an artist. It's the same idea, right? And then, um, but they have this book to look look to 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 inspire to it's for the little boys and the little girls that can say oh it's not only a man that is represented doing something but a woman too so it's a really nice kind of way to you know change the mindset of what we live in this in today's society because you you you're you're talking about women and it doesn't start only with you know feminism doesn't only start with girls but it starts with boys too and it's and it's about teaching both sides about you know that women are the same as men right yeah. thank you for joining us for project women way where we had the opportunity to talk with humaira michelle yamina and irushi i have been promina shasta and thank you and have a good time attending wow global 24
beautiful bird called porcupine and rabbit and birds of all kinds. It's like a book. So we sit by the river and we watch the sun rise from there. Beautiful memories that never fade from my mind. And that is the inspiration to all my books. Quite a lot of monkeys used to be very familiar in our surroundings. We had a dill tree in our garden. They used to come and sit there and eat all the raw dill. Uh, one day, a monkey came down to the ground, walked into my grandmother's kitchen, picked up a mirror, looking at his face like this, he went up. And another thing was, in our village, there were no umbrellas. That is the truth. And people in the rain used to always carry a banana leaf or a palladium leaf or something like that. They never carry umbrella. I was very fascinated to see this sight. Then I thought I put together these two incidents. Somehow this monkey story came together in my mind and I wrote this umbrella thief story. प्रकृति और विश्व ब्रह्मांडेर शारुप जिनी जिनी और धेक नारी और धेक पुरुष शे और धनारी शार मंगल दायक महेश्वर के आमी प्रणाम करी कस्तुरी का चंदन लेपनाये Smashan Vasmanga Vilepanaya Sankundalaya Fani Kundalaya Namaha Shivaya कपाल माला परिशुभिताय हिमांगदाय शनांगदाय नमस्शिवाय Yeah.
I work at the International Center for Diary and Disease Research. I'm a senior scientist, actually I'm an emeritus scientist. I don't like to be called uh, emeritus scientist, so I call myself senior scientist. And I'm an infectious disease expert. Basically, I'm an immunologist and I work on vaccines and trying to understand how diseases uh, work and how vaccines work and what is the capacity of our body in people in Bangladesh to face these diseases. But I also have a foundation of my own, which I call IDESHI, which is the Institute for Developing Science and Health Initiatives. Over there, I do uh, infectious disease also and genetic disorders and many other things. So I've contributed with all my life savings and all my prizes to this institute. So as a woman, I have uh, gone through many challenges. Uh, um, First of all, let me tell you that, you know, woman, for a woman, life is never easy. Uh, it's a, a stereotyping that we fall into, and Bangladesh is no exception. We, it is even higher in Bangladesh to be stereotyped. And to come out of the stereotype is difficult, but I had a, a very big support in my life. It was my grandmother who made us value ourselves very much as a woman. And so from that time onwards, uh, Education, we understood, was very important. Women had to be on their feet, must have a profession, must do things. So, uh, let me tell you that, you know, it's, uh, although I had a lot of backing from my from people at home, but it's not so easy. And so when you want to develop a career in science, and you want to have a scientific career especially, it means long hours in the lab. It means lots of thinking, lots of dedication. And if you, put that together with family life, sometimes it may be a problem. So most people uh, in, in all over the world do a lot of very good, have very good careers in education. But as, the, as soon as they want to have a professional life, uh, they don't get the support or they don't have the willpower, and so they give up. So we know this thing about STEM, science, technology, electronics, and mathematics. There's a very big gap, only 30% women are in STEM. And also when you look at universities everywhere in the world, uh, the, the professional career of women, they come to a certain stage and they stop. Now why is this difference between men and women? I think uh, women are held back for many reasons. 
uh, first of all, as soon as they are on their feet, they reach their education, start their career, they are, they are married, most of them, and then they have children. So for me it was the same. I had uh, three children in uh, six years' time, and so I had a very, very busy schedule. I took three children in four years' time, and I was very, very busy. And so, uh, at one, I, but I never gave up. I always felt that I must do something in my life. And so, I worked hard in the labs, and my counterparts, my male counterparts, did not always take it very well. They thought I was not a responsible mother, and that my children wouldn't grow up properly. And so, I had to deal with that. But let me tell you about what we face in Bangladesh. We do face a lot of problems uh, in Bangladesh. Not all families accept women to stay long at work, not to give, because uh, it's traditional and it's still, even in modern times, people expect the woman to uh, be the role model at home as a mother and not as, a, uh, as the earning member in the family. So that seems a dilemma. And so I can tell you, if I take the example of what I'm doing now, I'm basically a person who worked on diarrhea and diarrheal diseases, but uh, as we had COVID-19 coming up in Bangladesh, I sensed that you know, there was something that I could do. And from that time onwards, I changed my complete mode of work and I'm working on COVID-19. And I work a lot in my foundation and um, I've tried to help set up a lot of testing in Bangladesh. But what I noticed was that uh, there were lots of people working with me everywhere, but the, recept the response I got from my female uh, people at work was uh, very disappointing. I have only one woman who works with me. Most women felt that it would not be safe for their families if they came out to work in, uh, on COVID-19. So that's not such a nice thing for us. But uh, so we do face, face many challenges. Bangladesh, you uh, know, is very successful because all the women are out doing so many things, working at different levels in the garment factories in the field. But when it comes to a higher level, uh, you you see that the, there is uh, not an equality in shame. And so uh, the, the trend is still that uh, women should stay back, be more of the family tending. And so I think uh, we do have a challenge even now, but I think that uh, yeah, as my as being a role or model for women around me um, in science, I feel that it's my responsibility to tell the women, help them, tell them ways to do things. They can do work a lot during the office time, and then they can go home and work from home. And that is needed. But I also have to tell my men for who work with me how to how to treat women, how to think of me as a woman and also as a leader. And that is, I think, an important thing because then they take it down into generations. So with that, I say I'm very happy to be a woman. I wouldn't have liked to be anything else. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Anusha Ashraf, and I'm making this video all the way from Karachi, Pakistan. I've been very excited to be associated with the WOW Festival in Karachi. And then later, when it took place in London this year, I was there. And uh, it was such an amazing feeling, and I'm so proud to be a part of this uh, this group of wonderful women from around the world. Um, once I got back from London, right after this amazing wow experience, uh, you know, I came down to a country where the pandemic was on the rise, where people were confused whether we should go into lockdown or not, because uh, can we really afford to go down, uh, like shut down entirely? Was the question. Uh, there's too many people over here who survive on daily wages families that need support on a regular day, uh, you know, on a regular basis. So it was a little hard for me to, to, to make a decision as to whether I should go into complete isolation, uh, but I did. I tried to be responsible and once my isolation after my trip to London was over, I took it upon myself to uh, just start helping people in any and every capacity that I can. And it kept me busy through the lockdown. Uh, so I was getting these ration bags ready, uh, which provided food for families of up to five for like a whole month. Uh, we distributed them around the city to 1,500 homes. So initially that kept me busy. And once that was over, I decided to uh, 
get to the animal shelter and I and I adopted five beautiful animals one of them is right here making a lot of noise <laughs> off the camera so um, yeah so my animals are keeping me busy I'm taking care of them I'm, I'm providing for them I'm walking them so they kind of keep me you know I've been trying to do all the things that I had I hadn't had the opportunity to do when things were regular and we were all just so busy with our lives uh, I'm a TV presenter and I'm a radio jockey so uh, one of my jobs is also to keep people motivated through the pandemic. Luckily for me, I had work. I was recording from home, but I had to get my show ready on a daily basis, which uh, was kind of good for me in a way because I knew that I still had a job and I was doing something productive. Um, however, I happen to speak to a lot of women who are married with children, how they're coping. I try to help them out. Uh, you know, we all try to figure out a routine together. Uh, we all go live on Instagram uh, once in the evening on my Instagram to chit chat about how they're coping and managing. Uh, we spoke a lot about mental health and how people are coping in terms of the pandemic and their anxiety or their depression that may be kicking in, at, kicking in at this point. So, um, yeah, and just made a regular routine and told myself that, you know, this year is going to be a lot about uh, self-reflection and getting to know myself and taking it for what it is and just trying to spend more time with myself um, and discovering who I am. So I've taken up an art class online. Uh, I have a, I, I am trying to, you know, like I said, I adopted a bunch of animals. I made a room outside my house so I could make it into like a little workstation, put a lot of plants in there. Now I sit there working all day and I have a little meditation corner as well. So, you know, I mean, different parts of my house feel like different places. So I feel like, hmm, this is my office, this is my workout, that's my meditation room, this uh, the garden is where the animals are, and that's how I'm going to play with them. So I've kind of divided my day that way. And uh, speaking to a lot of other single girls, I've been in touch with them constantly because of my radio show and because I go live on Instagram every other day. I mean, we've all been hanging on to each other for support, and I think that's been our greatest strength, to be honest, uh, to see each other through. You know, how we, I'm in these groups of girls online on facebook on whatsapp where we're just sharing articles um, going online and chit chatting catching up with we, each other once a day on zoom having these video calls and just keeping us as motivated till things settle down so yeah this is what's been keeping me busy this has been my routine and i'm thankful that uh, you know i've had the opportunity to help people in the process as well and um, I hope I can continue to do so and continue to spread positivity through my radio show and my shows on digital media, uh, even though it's challenging sometimes. But I try and do my best and I get a lot of love and affection in return, so it's kept me going. Uh, thank you for hearing me out and um, I hope to hear stories from you ladies from around the world and I hope to see you guys uh, again in person soon, inshallah. Thank you. আমি মিস জয়িতা পলি ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটির অধিকার নিয়ে কাজ করি এবং তিনি আলো হিজড়া সংঘ রাজশাহীর জয়েন সেক্রেটারি পাশাপাশি একজন ক্ষুদ্র নারী উদ্যোক্তা ছোট থেকে পর্যন্ত আমার পরিবারের সঙ্গে আমার বেড়ে ওঠা পরিবারের সঙ্গে আমি আছি কিন্তু পরিবারের সাথে থাক থাকতে ছোট থেকে পর্যন্ত আমাকে অনেক অবহেলার শিকার হতে হয়েছে অনেক নির্যাতনের শিকার হতে হয়েছে তারপরও পরিবারের সঙ্গে আছি আমি ছোট থেকেই মানে আমার ভিতরে একটা ইয়ে ছিল যে আমি পরিবার যুদ্ধ হবো না পরিবার থেকে আমাকে যতই লাঞ্ছনা বঞ্চনা দেখ আমি পরিবারের আর পাঁচজনের সঙ্গে থাকবো পরিবারের সদস্যদের সাথে থাকবো সেই হিসাবেই পরিবারের সঙ্গে থাকা তো আমার হচ্ছে ছোট থেকে আমি ভাবতাম যে আমাদের যে ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটি আছে তারা তো সমাজ রাষ্ট্র পরিবার পরি সব কিছু থেকে বঞ্চনার শিকার অবহেলিত আমি তাদের জন্য কোনো কাজ করতে অধিকার নিয়ে কাজ করতে চাই তো দু হাজার দুই সালে দু হাজার দুই সাল থেকেই আর কি এই কমিউনিটির রাইটস নিয়ে কাজ করার সুযোগ পেয়েছি প্রথমে ভলেন্টিয়ার ছিলাম ভলেন্টিয়ার থেকে রাজশাহীতে যে তিন আর হিদ্রা সংঘ আছে সেই হিদ্রা সঙ্গে নির্বাহী পরিষদে নির্বাচিত হই সেই থেকে হিজড়া কমিউনিটির রাইটস নিয়ে কাজ করছি আর এইখানে কাজ করতে গিয়ে অনেক বাধার সম্মুখীন হয়েছি পরিবার থেকে অনেকে বলে তুমি কেন ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটি নিয়ে কাজ করবা পরিবারে থাকতে পারবো না পরিবারে রাখবো না এবং পরিবারও রাখতে চায় না সমাজের বিভিন্ন জায়গায় হেয় প্রতিপন্ন হতে হয়েছে তারপরও তাদের সঙ্গে আছি আর পাশাপাশি আমি এক সোশ্যাল ওয়ার্কেও কাজ করি 
প্রতিবন্ধী নিয়ে কাজ করি সমাজের যে অবহেলিত নারীরা আছে তাদের নিয়ে কাজ করি হিজড়াদের কর্মসংস্থানের জন্য কাজ করি আপনারা জানেন যে হিজড়া কমিউনিটিকে কিন্তু সমাজে কেউ কোনো কর্মসংস্থান দিতেই চায় না বাসা ভাড়া দিতে চায় না আমাদের এই প্রবলেমগুলো সব থেকে বড় প্রবলেম যে আমাদের কেউ বাসস্থান দিতে চায় না বা কর্মসংস্থানের জন্য আমার অ্যাবিলিটি আছে আমি এই কাজটা পারবো বা আমার যোগ্যতা আছে কিন্তু তারপরও আমার আইডেন্টির জন্যে তাদেরকে কর্মসংস্থান দেওয়া হয় না এবং বাসা ভাড়া দেওয়া হয় না পাশাপাশি আমি আজকে খুদ একজন ক্ষুদ্র নারী উদ্যোগ সাফল্য উদ্যোক্তা হিসাবে প্রায় রাজশাহীতে পরিচিত হয়েছি এই জায়গাটায় যেতে আমার অনেক চ্যালেঞ্জিং অনেক চ্যালেঞ্জিং পার করতে হয়েছে অনেক প্রতিকূল অবস্থায় পার করতে হয়েছে প্রথম স্টেপে যেহেতু আমি আমার বুটিক্সের বিজনেস সেই বিজনেসে আমার কাছে কেউ কোনো পণ্যই নিতে চাইত না যে ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটির কাছে পণ্য নেব বা কেউ আমার আমার শোরুমে বা আমার আমি যখন কোথাও মেলা দিতে গেছি সেখানেও আমার আমার কাছে ক্রেতা একেবারে কম ছিল তবুও আমি মানে ধৈর্য হারায়নি নিজের ভিতরে একটা কনফিডেন্স ছিল যে একদিন জয় আসবে ইনিশাল্লা আমি এখন অনেক ভালো আছি আমার প্রতিষ্ঠানটা অনেক ভালো আছে আমার প্রতিষ্ঠানে ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটি এবং সমাজের অবহেলিত প্রায় চারশো জন ওখানে কর্মসংস্থানের ব্যবস্থা হয়েছে তারা এখনও কর্ম করছে আমার প্রতিষ্ঠানে আর বলতে চাই এখনও কিছু অনেক বাধা আছে যদি বলি বাধাগুলো কি পরিবারও কিন্তু এখনও অনেক ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটিকে পরিবারে রাখতে চাচ্ছে না এটা একটা বড় বাধা সমাজ এখনও সেভাবে অ্যাকসেপ্ট করেনি কমিউনিটিকে এবং রাষ্ট্রীয় দু হাজার তেরো সালে রাষ্ট্রীয় ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটি থার্ড জেন্ডার হিসাবে স্বীকৃতি একটা স্বীকৃতি গ্রেজুয়েট পাশ করেছে কিন্তু এখন পর্যন্ত কোনো নীতিমালা কোনো আইন পাশ করেনি সংসদে তাদের আমাদের কি ঝোলায় রাখছে এটা একটা বড় সমস্যা আমাদের জন্য কোনো পণ্য বাসনের ব্যবস্থা করেনি সরকার চাকরির কোনো কোটা নাই আমি চাই যে ও মানে অতি সাধ্য যদি এগুলো যদি ব্যবস্থা করে তাহলে এই কমিউনিটি সমাজ যে মূল স্রোত ধারায় খুব সহজে ফিরে যেতে পারবে সরকারের কাছে এটা আমার চাওয়া যে তাদের যেন প্রত্যেকটা জেলায় যেন পণ্য বাসনের ব্যবস্থা সৃষ্টি করে এবং কর্ম তার নিজ নিজ যোগ্যতা অনুযায়ী যেন তাদেরকে কর্মসংস্থানের ব্যবস্থা করে পাশাপাশি আমার মতো অনেকেই উদ্যোগী হওয়ার চেষ্টা করছে কিন্তু সরকার থেকে কোনো ধরনের ঋণ তারা পাচ্ছে না যদি তারা সরকার থেকে কোনো অল্প শোধে বা সহজ সত্যি যদি কোনো ঋণ প্রদান করা হতো তাহলে এই ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটি তারা উদ্যোগী হতো এবং উদ্যোক্তা হয়ে সমাজের সকল শ্রেণীর মানুষের হাতে হাত মিলিয়ে বসবাস করতে পারত এবং তাদের একটা কর্মসংস্থানের সৃষ্টি হতো যেটা দেখে সারা বিশ্ব সারা বাংলাদেশ একটা রোল মডেল তৈরি হতো যে ট্রান্সজেন্ডার কমিউনিটির তাদের প্রতি যে ভ্রান্ত ধারণা ছিল সেটা অবশ্যই মানুষের মধ্যে থেকে দূর হবে আমার কাছে মনে হয়
दुई मा छिमेकी रंत मेरे उमेर को संख्या भाग धीरे केटा को विज्ञापन लिये मेरे घर तीर धाँच मूर्ति का साँचो में ढाली मूर्ति बनाए झ हाँने बोलने शैली शरीर को ढांचा घर करने केटी में ढाली मारे पाप पाले पुण्य ये दुई वचन में मेरे घर रर फे मेरे क्षमता भाषा एवटा कोठा अर्क कोठा हुई सिंगो घर भि भौतार मेरो चाहना मेसिन छापी को नोट लगो हो जिसको आकार प्रकार प्रयोग सब निश्चित हो मैं रंगीन सपना भरने बाधा रंधन ने होना लुगा ले तो मौसम अनुसार दराज बट निस्कन पाँच मेरे सर्टिफिकेट निस्कन कुन मौसम चाहिए हो अब तोक मेरे लगी उठने बस्ने हिड़ने तालिका बना समस्या रंकट सड़क बाजार में खोजना सुरक्षा को आड़ में मेरे स्वतंत्रता खोजना मेरे जीवन में तिम्रो भाग पहले रेरे अधिकार मेरो अनि मेरो हर एक सानो ठूल सपना स्वतंत्रता मलाई म बना I really got interested in industrial design because I came with this engineering kind of background from home where my dad and my brothers were all engineers but I ended up not really enjoying industrial design because I found architecture far more exciting that's where architecture started when I went to the UK and I came back Mr Baba was sick The trust asked me. At that point, they had closed Mr. Baba's office, and they had a whole lot of drawings in their possession. And I was given the task of sorting them out and trying to do the initial round of archiving for the drawings. I was trying to set myself up as an architect, which all happened from the back of my double cab at the time. I didn't have an office. The Inadisiva House is a beautiful house. The reconstruction of it was a big realization of the value of this sort of space. And that made me look at other people who had done it, and the scale and the location. Even if we preserved it where it was, it wouldn't have had the same qualities. The sound would have changed. Everything would have changed. So. Also, some of the details and some of the beautiful way the materials work together. Today, we have a whole other palette of materials. It was also of a certain time. Hello everyone. My name is Fazia and I'm a fellow and faculty at the Center for Water Informatics and Technology, Lahore University of Management Sciences, LAMS in Pakistan. Currently, I am working from home and my home happens to be Upper Hunza, which is one of the most cleanest, pristine and most beautiful part not only in Pakistan but also in the world. I therefore understand the importance of living in such an environment and leaving such an environment for our future generations to come as well as for our biodiversity on this planet.
COVID-19 has emerged as a global issue that we've never had to face before. It is a lot of primary and secondary consequences and one such secondary consequence that is very important to me is the issue of plastic pollution. I understand that in order to protect ourselves and our loved ones, we need to wear masks, gloves and use sanitizers that come in plastic bottles. Masks and gloves are either made of plastic or contain some amount of plastic in them. This means that if discarded improperly, they could end up living in this planet for a much, much longer time. It is therefore important that first of all, if we are going out, we try and use reusable and rewashable masks and gloves so that we do not end up throwing them or they don't become a single-use plastic pollution source. According to a study by WWF, if only 1% of the masks that we're using globally is discarded improperly today, we could end up having 1 million masks in the ocean. Now this is a huge problem because each mask weighs around 4 grams and that means that we could end up having 40 million grams of pollution in the form of masks in our ocean. That is going to have a greater consequence of, on life in the ocean, which is also already suffering because of our inappropriate actions and our consumerism in this planet and, our, and the way we throw plastic pollution in our environment. Now, what does pollution in the form of personal protective gears mean to me and to my region? First of all, we do not have a recycling plant. So even if the sanitizer bottles, the gloves and the masks happen to be recyclable, we're not going to have to be able to recycle them in our part of the world. So that is the first and foremost important thing to know. So of course, the most important thing for us would be to at least have a recycling setup set up in this part of the world. Secondly, I don't think we had a lot of options as a purchaser, as a buyer, as a consumer in the form of what do we need to buy in order to protect our environment. Uh, there are some local organizations like Cardo who've now trained women to stitch um, uh, fabric masks which are washable and therefore reusable. Um, some people might question um, its protection uh, against viruses but I think it can still protect us from bacteria so that's a good action, a good step that is being taken by Cardo which is run by women and all the masks are being stitched by, by women so it is very a very positive sign. So the takeaway from my little talk with you today is that we need action, both from the institutional side as well as from the individual side. Uh, first of all, our institutions need to have the right kind of policies. Those policies need to be implemented and each individual needs to take action towards protection of the environment. I hope that together we can save this planet and together we can fight this pandemic and the plastic pollution that it is causing. We all need to live responsibly. I hope that this has woken us up in terms of what we should and shouldn't do to protect our loved ones as well as our biodiversity and ecosystem. Shakalke Johar Gaurlagi Namaskar. Ami Shara Marandi, Bangladesh Uttor Poshchiman Chale, Bihotoro Dinaspur Jailar, Birampur Upojailar Adjun Shaltal Nari. Kaje Shubade Ami Pagutipur Upojailar, Gramdika Shkendre, Social Development কর্মসূচির পরিচালক হিসেবে কাজ করছি এর সাথে আমি আমাদের ফাউন্ডেশন নামে একটি উন্নয়নমূলক সংস্থার ফাউন্ডার মেম্বার বাংলাদেশ আদিবাসী ফোরামের একজন সদস্য জাতীয় আদিবাসী পরিষদের সাথে কাজ করছি সানাম হেরিটেজ নামে একটি প্রতিষ্ঠান রয়েছে যারা ঐতিহ্য নিয়ে কাজ করছে তাদের উপদেষ্টা হিসেবে কাজ করছি এতগুলি জায়গায় কাজ করছি কিন্তু এই জায়গাটিতে আসা আমার আসলে একদিনই সম্ভব হয়নি এই পর্যায়ে আসতে আমার অনেক চড়াই উৎরাই পেরিয়ে আসতে হয়েছে কারণ প্রথমত আমি একজন নারী এবং তারপর একজন আদিবাসী সাঁওতাল নারী এর ফলে প্রতি পদে পদে আমাকে শুনতে হয়েছে প্রেরিত হয়েছে অনেক বাধা ও বিপত্তি কারণ আদিবাসী সাঁওতাল বলতেই মানুষের মানুষ পথে একটি চেহারা ভেসে উঠে যে অর্ধনগ্ন কৃষ্ণ বর্ণের মানুষগুলি মনে হয় যে গহীন জঙ্গলে তারা শিকারে যাচ্ছে মনে হয় এরাই জীব বৈচিত্রকে ধ্বংস করেছে আবার অনেক সময় অনেকেই মনে করে যে আদিবাসী সাঁওতালরা বুঝি নোংরা এবং এরা বুঝি সবসময় মদ হারিয়ার মধ্যে ডুবে থেকে তারা মাটিতে লুটোপুটি খায় এরকমই একটি বাস্তবতা এরকমই একটি ভাবনার যে সমাজের মানুষগুলি মনে করছে সেই একটি জাতিগোষ্ঠী থেকে আমার উঠে আসা এবং আমি খুব গর্ববোধ করি যে আমি একজন সাঁওতাল কারণ আঠারোশো সালে যারা প্রথম ব্রিটিশ বিরোধী আন্দোলন করেছিল এই উপমহাদেশে সেই সিধু কানুর 
রক্ত আমার শরীরে বইছে এবং সেই সংগ্রামের মতো আমার জীবনেও প্রতি পদে পদে আমি অনেক সংগ্রাম অনেক জেদ অনেক স্বপ্ন নিয়ে পথ চলেছি বিশেষভাবে আমি স্মরণ করি আমার স্বর্গীয় পিতা হেমেন্দ্রনাথ মারান্ডি এবং স্বর্গীয় মাতা নাসন মুর্মু এবং সেই সাথে স্মরণ করছি এবং সবসময় যিনি আমার সাথে পথ চলছে আমার স্বামী উনি সবসময় আমাকে সহযোগিতা করছে ডেভিড হাসদা এবং আমাকে সাহস জুড়িয়ে যাচ্ছে বা আমার যে প্রতিকূলতা আমি প্রথম মুখোমুখি হয়েছিলাম যখন কিনা আমি স্কুল এবং কলেজের গন্ডি পেরিয়ে আমি যখন বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ে পড়তে যাব সেই সময়ে উনিশশো সাতানব্বই সালে আমার বাবা মাত্র বাহান্ন বছর বয়সে উনি মারা যান এবং এরপর থেকে আসলে আমাদের পরিবারে একটি বড় সমস্যার মুখে আমরা পড়ি এবং একটা খুব ভালো জমি ছিল এগারো শতক জমি এবং সেই জমিটা আমরা বিক্রি করি পরে আমি ইন্ডিয়াতে চলে যাই এবং সেখান থেকে আমি ইংলিশ লিটারেচারে আমার গ্রাজুয়েশন কমপ্লিট করে বাংলাদেশে আসি পরবর্তীতে আমি বাংলাদেশে এসে আমি গ্রাম বিকাশ কেন্দ্রে আমি যুক্ত হই দুই হাজার দশ সালের দিকে আমি একটি ইন্টারন্যাশনাল সংস্থা ভলেন্টারি সার্ভিস ওভারসিস সেখানে যোগদান করি এর ফলে যেটি হয়েছিল বিশেষভাবে ঢাকায় যখন আমি ছিলাম বিএসওতে সেই সময় আমার একটি বড় স্বপ্ন ছিল যে জাতীয় পর্যায়ে বা আন্তর্জাতিক পর্যায়ে যে সকল সংগঠনগুলি আদিবাসীদের নিয়ে কাজ করছে তাদের সাথে কাজ করার তাদের সাথে যোগসূত্রতা গড়ে তোলার এবং যেটি সবচেয়ে মজার বিষয় ছিল যে দুই হাজার ষোলো সালে আমি যখন বিএসও ত্যাগ করি সেই সময় আমি একটি বেশ মোটা টাকার অঙ্ক পাই সময় আমরা যে জমিটা বিক্রি করেছিলাম আমার পড়াশোনার জন্য সেই মালিক আমাদের কাছে আসে এবং উনি জানান যে উনি এই জমিটা বিক্রি করতে চান এবং আমাদের কাছে বিক্রি করতে চান তো আমার মাকে যখন আমি বললাম তা আমার মা খুবই খুশি হয়েছিল এবং আমার কাছে এটা একটা রূপকথার মতো লাগছিল যে যে জমিটি কি আমরা মনে করছিলাম অনেকে মনে করছিল যে নষ্ট করছি কারণ সেই সময়গুলিতে আসলে মাকে অনেক সময় শুনতে হয়েছে যে মেয়েদের পড়াশোনা করিয়ে কি হবে কারণ একদিন তারা তো স্বামীর বাড়িতে চলে যাবে তার থেকে বরং মেয়েদের বিয়ে দিয়ে দেওয়া ভালো কিন্তু পরে যখন আমি মানে সেই সুযোগটা পেলাম আসলে আমার খুবই আনন্দ হয়েছিল যে আমি আবারও আমার বাবার সেই সম্পত্তিটি আমি আবার ফিরে পাই এবং সেই উৎসাহ উদ্দীপনা নিয়ে এখনো আমি আমাদের আদিবাসী সমাজের জন্য আমি মনে করি যে কাজ করে যাব এবং সেটা আমার দায়িত্ব বলে মনে করি আজকে যদি বলি যে এখন আমরা একটি যুদ্ধের মাঝে রয়েছি যেটি কোভিড উনিশ বা কোভিড নাইনটিনের যে যুদ্ধ এবং আমাদের আদিবাসী মানুষগুলো কিন্তু খুব ভালো নেই বিশেষভাবে আদিবাসী নারী এবং বৃদ্ধা যারা রয়েছে তারা প্রচুর পরিমাণে সংকটের মধ্যে রয়েছে বিশেষভাবে তাদের পুষ্টিকর খাবার এই সময় দরকার তারা পাচ্ছে না সেই সাথে যারা শিশু রয়েছে আমরা জানি যে এই সময় স্কুল কলেজ সবকিছু বন্ধ এবং শিশুরা ঠিক মতো পড়াশোনা করতে পারছে না এবং আমি এই সাথে আহ্বান করছি এই সময় এই সংকটকালের মুহূর্তে আমরা যে যার অবস্থান থেকে এই আদিবাসী মানুষগুলোর কাছে এই তান্ত্রিক মানুষগুলোর কাছে আমরা যেন এগিয়ে আসি এবং স্বাধীনতা সাতচল্লিশ বছর পরে আমরা যেটি অনুভব করছি আমরা যেভাবে এগিয়ে গিয়েছিলাম কিন্তু আমাদের এই কোভিডের যে যুদ্ধ যে মহামারী এখানে কিন্তু অনেক একটা প্রতিকূলতার মধ্যে আমরা সময় পার করছি এবং অনেকভাবে কিন্তু আমরা বাধাগ্রস্ত হচ্ছি আমাদের এই উন্নয়নে তো আসুন আমরা আরেকটি বার এগিয়ে আসি আরেকটি বার সোচ্চার হই এবং আমাদের সমাজ গঠনে আমাদের যে বিভিন্ন জাতিগোষ্ঠী রয়েছে সেই জাতিগোষ্ঠীদের রক্ষার জন্য আমরা এগিয়ে আসি ধন্যবাদ সবাইকে
note to close on a true amalgamation of cultures language and color all melding together with one message an anthem for the women of the world festival hello again and a huge thank you to everyone who's been watching the south asia program at wow global 24 
I would like to thank the WOW Foundation for bringing this festival together at this time of unprecedented strife and anxiety, but equally when the need for these conversations and art offerings is more critical than ever before. A massive thanks also to their global founding partner, Bloomberg, and global partner, MasterCard, for making the foundation's work possible. I would also like to say thanks to all of the artists and speakers who joined us today for the festival for sharing their work, their ideas, and their passion. For me, this festival is full of light and love, sisterhood and support. I will hear the echoes of Harsakya's incredible rendition of Avalham through the day, and my thoughts will be filled with the powerful poetry presentation by the Word Warriors. Every WOW festival that I have been lucky enough to be a part of has been a gift. I always leave enriched, and I hope you have all felt the love and energy as well today. Because until we change the world enough that we do not need to talk about the challenges women and girls face simply because they are women and girls, WOW will remain a critical platform. I'm so grateful for the opportunity I have had for the past four years to be a part of this initiative, which is so very close to my heart and has allowed me to work with and learn from such a diverse cross-section of very talented people. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank British Council teams globally for all their support and for the partners in Bangladesh, CCD and Mongol Deep Foundation and from Nepal, a very special shout out to Pradya Yonzon and Sara Shistra for their support and video editing and of course to Kensa Davey for the subtitling. 